to TKR, UKR has superior clinical and functional outcomes, significantly reduced morbidity and mortality, and it is more cost effective. So UKR is right, and this one is the uh, joint registry. It is being done on more than one lakh matched knees. Out of them, 25,000s were UKR, 75,000s were TKR. The findings were mortality significantly higher for TKR at all point of time, length of stay in the hospital, major complications like thromboembolism, MI, DVT, stroke, and rate of readmissions were all higher in TKR group. The only negative part of this joint registry was that the revision surgery rate were higher in UKR. They were 2.1% as compared to 0.76% in TKR. So UKR is right. More than 96% 10-year survival rates, less invasive, less intra-op time, less intra-op complications, better outcomes, and lower long-term complications. And one, the last and the foremost, that the patient likely to forget the presence of implant the knee, inside the knee. And this has been documented by Zubedan in 2017 and being reconfirmed by Jem Sargil in 2021. But then, why, it is f why we are feared about the UKR? The fear factors are, one, increased revision rates, progression to other compartment, and the patellofemoral arthritis. Now, the revision has got bias. Why it is bias? Because revising threshold of orthoplasty surgeons for UKR is quite low. Inappropriate complaints and the UKR is being revised to TKR. The patients who are being offered UKR are of young age group, so they have high activity level, they have more wear and tear, and they have high expectation about the implant. So actually they live longer, so they might get one revision in their lifetime. Another important factor is steep learning curve. The steep learning curve because technically it is a demanding procedure, so it has got less error of margin than the TKR. And last one, the acceptance. Acceptance means what? For the same OKS scores or the same knee scores, the TKR is being continued while the UKR is being revised. So UKR is right. New, new papers, the same systemic review, it comments that there were negligible differences between the two techniques in post-operative revisions in early and mid-term follow-ups. Another paper, the original article uh, about the current prospectives, what it comments, if a surgeon uses 20% of his, his case loads to UKR, he is going to do lesser mistakes, his results will be more optimal, and the revision rates were being higher at those centers where the UKR was with the UKR, he can achieve optimal results. So next point is patellofemoral arthritis. What about the patellofemoral arthritis when you are dealing with only medial compartmental OA? While doing an UK, the state of PFJ can be ignored. Till the lateral facet of the patella, you get some bone loss, for full thickness bone loss, aberration, or longitudinal grooves. These are few papers who are telling about the result that the pre-existing patellofemoral disease does not affect 10-year survivorship in fixed-bearing unicondylar knee orthoplasties. Another factor was progression of the disease. Again, this was the paper which has compared 1 lakh knees for the adverse outcomes of both total and unicondylar knee replacement, which said that the revision surgery rates are 2.1% in UKR, but it's also said that the progression of disease to the lateral compartment was ranked quite lower in the list for revision. So the UKR is right, and the fair factors can be countered by optimal use of the implant, right indications, and right technique. So what are the indications? Coming to the indications of the UKR, the first and the foremost indication is anteromedial osteoarthritis, then SONC, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee, and last one is the lateral compartment osteoarthritis. How do you judge the anteromedial osteoarthritis? The principal physical signs are the pain in standing and severe on walking, and it's being relieved by sitting. In extension, you can get a knee in varus around 5 to 15 degrees, but this varus is correctable when the knee is flexed to 20 degrees and you are doing a valgus thrust. The varus corrects spontaneously with the knee flexed in 90 degrees. The main pathophysiological key points about the anteromedial osteoarthritis are intact ACL, 
normal MCL, it is not contracted and intact lateral tibial femoral cartilage. How do you evaluate them? I will come to that. Radiological indications for anteromedial osteoarthritis is bone on bone disease. It should be the medial compartment, the bone should be touching. They should not be apart. This is the right indication for anteromedial osteoarthritis to be considered for UK. And the another picture is the wrong indication because we are able to see a small space medial joint line so that some cartilage is there. But then for establishing the bone on bone contact, what right axis you should take? Non weight bearing x-rays, not at all right. AP, weight bearing x-rays can establish a bone on bone contact. If you're not able to see that and the patient is having quite a lot of symptoms, which you're convinced that it is because of the medial OA, then you can go for Rosenberg view. And if even in Rosenberg view, you're not able to see a bone on bone contact, you can go for a virus stress view, which can confirm whether a full thickness cartilage loss is there or not. Another views which we have to take for taking the uh, patient into consideration for the UKR is a true lateral view. The true lateral view, when both the femoral components, uh, condyles are superimposed on each other, then if the posterior extent of the any bone loss or erosion is present, it means the ACL is gone. If the posterior tibial plateau cartilage is intact, it means ACL is functioning. So evaluation of the ACL is on the lateral views, the true lateral views. Other X-rays which we require is valgus stress view, a sunrise view, and the true lateral we have talked about. The sunrise view is just to confirm what about the PFJ, the medial facet is how, and the lateral facet is whether it is having any full thickness loss or not. The valgus stress view is very important. This, this indicates that if the medial joint space is opening, means the MCL is not contracted. And if the lateral joint space is still maintained, means the lateral cartilage is absolutely normal. These are few uh, papers which present that the medial bone on bone contact is necessary for giving optimal results by UKR. If you are picking a patient with mild osteoarthritis with a cartilage inside the medial joint and you are thinking that the UKR is going to give relief to that patient, it means you are ignoring some hidden causes which were giving him pain. When you open the knee, with all these kind of indications, what you see? You see an intact pristine ACL. If the ACL is intact, the lateral plateau, the lateral cond femoral condyle and the lateral facet of the uh, patella, they, they have a very good cartilage while the medial compartment is showing a full thickness loss. You, you are able to see a lot of calcific deposits. These are chondrocalcinosis, which are to be ignored, which I'll come later. So the criteria for doing UK in medial joint OA were being given by Cousin and Scott. And if you follow all these criteria, that it should be an isolated medial compartmental disease, no lateral joint tenderness, intact ACL, non-inflammatory arthropathy, weight below 82, 82 kgs, correctable virus deformity less than 5%, age over 60 years, flexion contracture less than 5, de 5 degrees, and range of motion 90 degrees, only 6 to 12 percent of the OA patient, they are eligible, they, they are fit for that criteria who are coming to you for total joint replacement or knee replacement therapy. Now, we have extended indications for that. These were the initial criteria and what the current opinions are that the PFJ is not absolute contraindication. ACL deficiency is not an absolute contraindication. If you are going for a mobile bearing joint, ACL should be intact. If ACL is deficient and patient is having only medial joint compartment osteoarthritis, he can be benefited by fixed bearing device. BMI is poorly correlated in all recent studies. Less than 10 degree varus is acceptable. Less than 5 degree valgus is acceptable for choosing a patient for UKR. And less than 15 degree FFD is now being taken uh, very well for the UKR. The UKR is successful in less than 60 years of patients also because many of those patients who are past six years of age, they might have tricompartmental disease. So the lateral osteophytes and chondrocalcinosis, what we are seeing in that picture, the lateral osteophytes do not represent a contraindication 
to medial unicompartmental knee orthoplasty and it was a 15 year follow up study done by uh, Hamilton and Pandit. So in summary, it should be a bone on bone contact, a functionally intact ACL, functionally intact MCL, a full thickness cartilage in the opposite compartment. These things all can be judged by simple proper views of digital x-rays or normal radiographs. PFJ and lateral osteophytes could be ignored to a certain extent. So who all are fitting for the UKR? Unicompartmental, sorry, I have to go back. So who all are fitting for UKR? Unicompartmental OA, high activity, young age patients, in, in fact the elderly also, if they fit into the category by x-rays. Age is no bar, BMI not correlated, deformities we have talked about, less than 10 degree of varus, less than 5 degree of valgus, less than 15 degree of FFD, ROM more than 90, ACL intact or deficient, depends what bearing we are going to choose, and patellofemoral arthritis and lateral osteophytes and con chondrocalcinosis, they could be ignored to some extent. So following these extended indications, now 47% of the OA patients are eligible to fall into UKR category, a study done in 2017. Where to use mobile and fixed bearing? We have already discussed that the mobile bearing requires an intact ACL. Fixed bearing could be a choice in both intact ACL and a deficient ACL. But the failure parts of these two are different. Mobile bearing mostly fails with the dislocation of the meniscal bearing while the fixed bearing has got some issues with the wear of the implant. But now we have uh, vitamin E uh, poly and high density, uh, cro highly cross-linked polys, so the wear is now not an issue for the fixed bearing implants also for, the, for their survivorship. So few cases. Uh, The patients were having antromedial osteoarthritis, which was being confirmed in different views, and patients are able to squat. Each and every patient who has been offered UKR is able to squat. This isn't working. Next case, another case. Every patient is able to squat fully with the UKR implant inside. Isn't rolling. So UKR is right if you choose the right patient with right indications in hands of right surgeon or the center who is practicing UKR and with the choice of right implant with a good instrumentation and technique. So I'll sum up my talk with that never overdo, give your patient a reasonable and functional option. Thank you. Um, a very uh, illustrative and educative talk. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to open the floor to the audience if anybody has any questions. Hi, sir. Just a quick question on the philosophy a young surgeon can uptake for a uni uh, case. Do you think we should start off with a fixed bearing or a mobile bearing? W what is something that we should take in a practice when you don't routinely do UKRs? Thank you. See, at present, the implants available in our country, the fixed bearing are basically based on measured resection, while the mobile bearing is basically based on gap balancing. The mobile bearing is being directed by the instrumentation being provided by the uh, company or the designer and that is giving the excellent results. But nowadays the fixed bearing part is also in practice in India and probably in later few years we are going to get the results of those fixed bearing and the technical complications or the technical difficulties about putting those fixed bearing implants inside the knee. Yeah, uh, fixed bearing is relatively little easier uh, than mobile bearing, 
but uh, it's not the rule that you should start with fixed bearing. Uh, I myself started with mobile bearing, have done all kinds of different implants. Uh, uh, you have to train yourself. Uh, there's learning curve, definitely. You should visit the surgeon who's doing it regularly, uh, assist him in a few cases, then plan it well. Uh, a well done UKR and a properly indicated patient, and, it, and TKR is no match to that. It's, it's like the forgotten implant in most of the patients. And uh, definitely in my own practice, fixed bearing uh, failure rate is a little high. Main reason in that is edge loading. And uh, uh, I have moved again more to mobile bearing. Uh, and uh, from last few years, I am observing myself how to position f uh, femur and tibia with the best of my uh, uh, trials, or you can say, try to prevent that edge loading. Still, in around 15 to 20 percent of cases, uh, you can't uh, escape it. So, uh, in mobile bearing, uh, that's not uh, complication, or uh, it takes care of edge loading. So uh, it's a little more forgiving f in my hands, I, I think. So I add on to this, that the, basically the basic design difference is there. A mobile bearing is more conformed device. So in full range of the ROM, the TBL plate, the TBL poly, is in full contact with the femur. While in fixed bearings, if you do more conformity, you're landing with more constants. So it is a choice between comfort and constants. So people who are doing mobile bearing, they are more fan of mobile bearing. And people who are doing fixed bearing, they are more towards fixed bearing. The difference between failure is altogether different. Mobile bearing, meniscal dislocations, fixed bearing, edge loading, and polywear. Uh, thank you, but my personal advice, I would suggest you pick up one philosophy. As Dr. Deepak said, you got one is gap balancing, the other is measured resection. So whichever philosophy you subscribe to, stick to it, and then um, get enough experience to uh, then change it. What I would not do is chop and change, do a couple of uh, mobile, and then decide you want to do fixed, and then go back to it. Um, I have a question for your presentation, sir. Uh, so, if you go back to your case three that you showed earlier, uh, I noticed that, that that didn't have bone on bone arthritis. So, I was going to come to that as a question. Might be, I, I may be missing one extra of that patient, but okay. these are the three views we should try. If you're not getting bone on bone on AP standing view, you can go for the Rosenberg view. If it is not on the Rosenberg view, then you should do a virus stress to just confirm that the disease is bone on bone. So the question to you then is, you, have, you will then have a cohort of patients who have grade two, grade three arthritis on radiological, but they keep coming to your clinic every two months with uh, severe pain in the knee. So what options do you have for them till they reach bone on bone? Uh, so that is the point, question number one. The question number two is by saying that they have to have bone on bone arthritis only, aren't you then treating the x-rays rather than the patient? So the, the, the two, two, two questions, the first question, that if the patient is having a disease of stage two or three, where you do not get bone on bone, one thing, where the x-ray is being done. The x-ray should be done at your center with your technician. If you are not able to establish the bone on bone contact in all these three view, the patient should be left for the conservative treatment, or you should investigate him for other pathologies, which might be giving medial joint line pain. The second question is, if the patient is having bone on bone, and if he is not symptomatic, till he is not symptomatic, you need not to treat the x-ray. No, what, what I was, um, I wasn't concentrating on the other pathologies. I was talking about patients with grade three arthritis who have severe pain. So in my experience, even if I see a little bit of gap between the bones, I get an MRI, which can then pick up grade four uh, changes within the femur. In those cases, I do give them uh, medial unicompartmental. So there are a lot of papers about the MRIs, uh, the role of MRIs in UK. What they say, that the inter-observer variation in MRI reporting is quite a lot. So probably, the, the philosophy we, we, which we have learned from, from the Oxford knee courses, that the thing should be X-ray first, MRI should be a second thought. MRI could be a second thought for excluding other soft tissue pathologies but not for confirming it is a bone-on-bone -bone disease. Uh, I would like to say about the last thing only. 
uh, practically in my patients, uh, in last six months I did it in three patients. Uh, there was no bone on bone in these three X-rays. Uh, I regularly get MRI done for my uni knee cases nowadays. Uh, so uh, in those cases, actually there was AMOA on, uh, th uh, you need three Tesla MRI, good radiologist. I go to radiology, see pics myself also on their computer, and uh, then we do cartilage mapping. And uh, it was there, I did unis on three, and they're fine. So uh, I learned this from Dr. Mullaji. Uh, he was getting MRI uh, of each and every patient of his for uni. And uh, I started doing it. I, I feel uh, as uni surgeon, if uh, we're planning, we should do it regularly. Okay. It, it may be, this study may come in the future. You know, don't know. Right. Any other questions on the floor? See, if it is bone on bone, there is no thought about the knee preservation. We do not have any modalities to preserve that knee, if it is bone on bone. You will have a lot big patches of cartilage loss in the femoral component or in the tibial plateau component. So knee preservation is out of question. If the patient is symptomatic, disease is bone on bone, there will be a root tear in the posterior horn of the medial, medial meniscus. No need to do that repair of the medial meniscus. It, it, do not, it, it will not give the pain relief to the patient. The pain relief will be done by addressing the bone-on-bone -bone pathology. See, in my experience, if, uh, if I see somebody with a grade three, I get the Rosenberg views. If it still does not show bone-on-bone, -bone, and the patient has the typical arthritic pain, so a couple of the points I ask for is nighttime pain. If they have nighttime pain, then it's usually arthritis that causes it. The second thing which I learned very early in my career is if you ask the patient to point out where they have the pain, they usually go there or they put the hand on the medial side. That to me is confirmatory of antromedial OA. Uh, in these cases, just to cover myself from a medical legal point of view, I would get an MRI. And as you say, there is a lot of variability. Um, so I bow down more towards the fixed bearing philosophy. So I'm quite happy even if the ACL is not there, um, I still go ahead and offer them a medial uni. It, it depends on the patient choice. You offer it to the patient. If the patient is involved in heavy manual work, it's a laborer, a lot of uh, jumping up and down, that kind of activities, then no. And then I refer it to my colleague who does HTOs. Uh, but anybody over the age of 50, then we advise them for unicompartmental. Um, quite a few of my patients, they ski, they cycle, they do marathons. So I think the old uh, indications of not doing it under the age of 60 is now out of the window. So the, uh, the indications are being expanded with good results. Uh, we are doing HTOs also regularly. For, for us, uh, the, the criteria he mentioned, obviously, along with age. Recently, we done it in 44-year-old female. She, she was bone on bone, uh, typical medial pain, but we did HTO. And, uh, prop, and before that, we did arthroscopy also. Yeah, uh, there was no meniscal tear, but obviously that hasn't rolled. Main is uh, excess change. Uh, obviously, had she been 52, 54, definitely I would have gone with uni only. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, next thing is uh, not the live surgery, but uh, Dr. Karthik, he wants to give his talk first, followed by the surgery. Uh, microplasty is space beyond comfort. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. uh, welcome Dr. Karthik. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Jitinder Singla here. I'm from Chandigarh, Max Chandigarh, and uh, Dr. Prasad Antapur from Bangalore. Okay, thank you uh, for a wonderful session we are going to have in afternoon. 
Uh, my talk is a bit different. Uh, I'm going to talk on uh, microplasty, a space beyond comfort. So without wasting time, uh, I think we are already late, so we'll start with that. So the World Journal of Orthopedics, very recent articles of 2018, why total knee fails? That is very interesting to see that a modern perspective has revealed that the recent problems with the total knee is not uh, previously what we had. More often it is more infection and instability that we are encountering. And these are very difficult issues in TKR. We all know that very well. And again, one more paper <clears throat> showing recent trends in revision knee arthroplasty. And the conclusion has one line that is very catchy and impressive, that our efforts to improve treatment strategies to delay primary arthroplasty to avoid periprosthetic joint infection. So one of the effort is to go for something better we can offer. Already so many talk, uh, so many discussion is done in the previous talk. So one more thing uh, which always uh, is a question mark in my own mind being a total knee surgeon as well, that alignment options for total knee arthroplasty, we are having a lot of confusion till date about the alignment of the knee. Started from the mechanical to kinematic to restricted kinematic, uh, then inverse kinematic, then we continued with the functional, uh, anatomical and constitutional and the artificial intelligence that added more horizons to our understanding and we are moving more towards the new alignment system that is a functional alignment system. But still, total knees doesn't have a solid uh, alignment guide for the surgeons. When we come to the ABCD, so we come to the B of a knee replacement, it is a balanced knee. And to my surprise, I found this paper, very recent paper, I think 2021, there is no reference point or gold standard with regards to achieve perfect balance. And apart from that, the things doesn't stop here. It shows we just lack an accepted definition of a balanced knee. I think this is I think uh, just like this, are you kidding me that we are struggling with alignment and the balance in a total knee? So why don't we chase something which is very easy and the word microplasty actually is divided into two parts. Micro means the detailed understanding of a pathology, of a disease itself, its progression, etiology, and that is an intellectual part of selecting a right patient that already mentioned in a previous lecture. And the plasty, we all know, the bring back function, shape, and its utility, it is more a technical part, and that carries a right surgical execution. We all have evolved from the anatomical criteria, which revolved in the world for a very, very long period of time. And finally, we understood that varus less than what? We don't know. We can't measure it. One leg standing, CT scan, we are struggling. Flexion deformities with anesthesia, without anesthesia. After local anesthesia in any, we don't know. Weight, how we can uh, say our patients that you should not increase your weight after a uni, we can't say that. An activity level, an obese patient after a uni, pain is gone and try to reduce the weight will go to an, any extreme of activity level. So this is not going to work in a way. These are more anatomical criteria. The rock solid foundation is evolution from a physiological criteria. So no numbers, no confusion. I strongly believe that uh, the numbers uh, the pathology will itself reflect the number, so we don't need to measure the deformities actually. Pathology should be understood by a simple radiological documentation. Not only that, the preserved physiology is confirmed and the wrong contraindications are removed. Now again we come to the x-ray, there is a lot of confusion which x-ray is and why. So this is simple thing to understand. If you get this x-ray on our standing OPD patient, Standing X-ray, bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, no tibial translation, the job is done for AP X-ray. But suppose if you get like this little bit of joint space reduction, and this is a time when there is no bone-on-bone, -bone and you have to go for a varus press view. If it is already varus bone-on-bone, uh, -bone, you don't need varus press view. So the role of varus press view is to demonstrate bone-on-bone -bone very clearly. But if you have a more advanced arthritis, you will have a bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, but tibial translation. Then this is the time you need a valgus stress view to see three things. Number one, that it's a correctable virus, what you have clinically seen, and you rely on your clinical acumen. Second thing, correctable tibial translation and the normal retro compartment in one X-ray. And it's a time now to go for the understanding if you op operate this 
category one patient, you will have this kind of tibial lesions more frequently. In this category, you will have this kind of bone lesions. And in this, you will have this kind of lesions. This is all a spectrum of anteromedial osteoarthritis and the progression of disease. If you go for a lateral x-ray, we all know that the posterior cartilage of tibia is, should be intact and it is good ACL, flexible varus, AMOA, and intact ACL are synonyms. And the right one x-ray shows the ACL deficient knees. They are usually fixed varus deformities where we need to go for a total knee. Again, when we come to the alignment, the total knee replacement is having alignment as an external feature. I believe alignment is internal in a unicompartmental knee arthroplasty. It is how you put your implants and how they work with each other in a concert. That is what we really believe in, unicompartmental knee replacement. The external alignment is always in natural alignment by the ligaments because there's a prerequisite. All four ligaments should be intact when we do most of our unis. So it is the space between the components and their alignment that makes sense in uni rather than the external alignment we are chasing. This is a demonstration of a poor alignment. We can easily appreciate the squeezing and suffering and suffocation of a poly between the two components. And this is called the poor alignment. It will end up in an internal impingement and the poly will definitely worn off very fast. And this is not a good uni. Patient needs revision for sure in such cases. Now we come to the balancing, very simple thing. This is a mobile bearing uni I have demonstrated here. This is a two millimeter spoon. This is loose. You don't need to be an orthopedic surgeon to understand this is loose. Anyone can say this is loose. Now if you try to put the four millimeter spoon in flexion gap, this doesn't go in. So this is very precise. On your fingertips, you will have an understanding that my bearing is going to be three millimeter bearing. And this is how you can have a feel to feel uh, in unicompartmental knee replacement. And there is going to be uh, three feelings when you use this, little bit tight, okay, and little bit of loose. So 0.3 millimeter of precision you are going to get when you are using a simple maneuver. The only thing you have to understand the principles of gap balancing. And now if you see the extension gap, you have to reproduce the same thing what you have done in flexion. Start with the two, which will be loose. So this is not going to be my extension gap. So I will try go for a four, the four millimeter spoon that doesn't go in. And this is tight, so I immediately understand that this is three millimeter. I will check that, and the three millimeter spoon will go with the same, a little bit of tight, very gentle tightness because of 0.4 millimeter of difference in flexion and extension gap. I will get my knee balanced without any confusion or any problem. This is an interesting case when you can see, anyone will say the right knee is bad, both knees are bad, for sure. This is a total knee patients. But uh, you can see the right is worse because of the posterior tibial osteophyte. That is termed as cupola. And actually, it serves as a stabilizer of a sagittal plane. That is sagittal plane stabilizer. That is confirmed that the intact ACL on the right side, but the ACL deficiency on the left side. So radiologically, right knee looks better. But clinically and interoperatively, you can see the right knee is better. And this is the postoperative x-rays. So the indications, we always have uh, definitions of indications, wrong indication, the indication, extended indication, relative contraindication, absolute contraindication. So we'll not go into much detail. It is already covered. But any indication has a spectrum of the factors that we need to understand from A to T, like age, bow legs, chondrocalcinosis, deformities. We'll just go and fast to see a few things. So age, again, age is not, I think, the thing criteria that we, we decide, the pathology is going to decide everything. And in young patients, the demand is function. In old age, demand is safety. And young age, revision is easy than osteotomy. And in old age, the bilateral is possible uh, with safety. So again, if this is an interesting paper, that bilateral uni is safer than a single TKR regarding the blood loss, transfusion, perioperative complications, hospital stay, and overall functional recovery. The coronal plane, we are all having a dilemma. Uh, so how to do, what to do? So correctable virus is most important, we see. And the aim of uni is correction of altered kinematics through natural alignment. So we are not here to restore the alignment or to do anything because ligaments are the best linkages. And we are just going to reproduce, uh, uh, we are just going to correct the meniscal pathology that is one of the key features. So see this x-ray, this looks scary uh, as a standing x-ray. And definitely, it looks like a total knee patient for sure. 
But if you go for a right valgus stress view, these are the indications where you need the valgus stress view. This is absolutely flexible varus, and this is the post-operative x-ray. So proper x-ray is very important for the diagnosis and planning of a uni. STO, definitely absolute contraindication. Fortunately, we came across one patient, beautiful case, right knee, total knee done, uh, left side STO done before 10 to 12 years. Very happy with the STO, knee out very well, right side TKR, extremely unhappy. So at any cost, they don't want to go for TKR. These are the x-rays, very well done STO. I think the debate should be in the how we can do the best STO. This STO has served its purpose, no hardware, nothing inside, no scar, and this is where you can consider, this is where you want to go for in, and you can go away with uni. So this can give our young patients very good STO for decades or one and a half decade, whatever the duration, and then you can really plan something if it is done well, then only. Stiff knees, not always soft issues. So you have to find it out clinically. If it is a bone like this, anterior envil osteophyte, posterior femoral and tibial osteophyte, this was a very stiff knee, but after the procedure, because the osteophyte were the pathology, we had got good result after the surgery. This is just a case, young patient with ACL deficiency and neglected, came with uh, postromedial wear and single stage uh, arthroscopy along with uni can be done. Uh, this is just to show this is a possibility and it can have a wonderful result as well. Again, ACL deficient knees, very elderly patient for safety. You can choose to have a partial knee replacement rather than going for a total knee replacement surgery. Obesity, as rightly mentioned, uh, is not an absolute contraindication, but it definitely needs a lot of experience and a different surgical technique so that you don't end up in a mess because once the mess is created here, it is going to be a tough and difficult total knee replacement after revising that failed uni. So this is what we understood after our lots of patients, obese patients, that your positioning is going to be very important part. And we, uh, just to remember, it is, we call this OTP technique that your tibia should be orthogonal to the floor, otherwise you will have a lot of problem. Proper tourniquet to uh, start uh, in applying on the thighs, because sometimes they are conical thighs, obese female patient, and the proper flexion you are able to get in hanging leg position, that is important. The pain varies. So previously it was a thumb taste and isolated joint line pain, but it is not the case. This paper beautifully mentioned that always the pain is all around the knees anteriorly and posteriorly. And to me, I think the best reparative gesture of the unicompartmental knee is appreciated by the patellofemoral joint. Uh, it goes away completely because if now there is a proper tracking of the patella, there should not be any pain. And we all agree upon that anterior knee pain does not mean patellofemoral joint arthritis and vice versa. So, patellofemoral joint is forgiving for this, and as rightly mentioned in uh, previous talk, lateral facet arthritis is not a right choice. So, hardware is not always a hard time. If you want to plan, you can plan it well with the uni. One more case again, you can get away with this without uh, disturbing anything. Very safe procedure without having more chances of infection and tissue dissection. Proclea is always very tricky, and especially in our, our part of the world uh, with uh, obese patients, sometimes female patient, and lateral patellar compression syndrome, the more Q angle, I really having more concern for the shape of trochlea rather than the patellofemoral joint. We had one patient who had lateral uh, ridge pain after one and a half year to two year of uh, partial knee replacement surgery, and we just need to do a small procedure. That is only one or two patients we had this problem with uh, lateral facet. Tibial translation, we know it has to be correctable. If it is not correctable, clinically you know that this is a total knee patient, but correctable, you can really think of this. And actually the nature tries to stop. This is a wonderful a demonstration of this. This tibial translation is happening, and it is prevented by the lateral eminence of a tibial spine, and you will see an ulcer on the lateral uh, non-weight-bearing portion of the lateral femoral condyle. And that's why we always feel this is a coronal plane stabilizer. It functions to stabilize the knee, and you can get away with this, and all the ligaments will have a physiological tension after you go for a partial knee replacement surgery. This is obese female patient uh, with extended indication for sure, but uh, we have now almost, uh, I think, uh, eight or nine years of follow of this lady. Uh, lateral thrust, short stature, external rotation, and bone on bone arthritis, significant bone on bone arthritis, rather, tibia was completely scalloped, but still, the anterior cruciate ligaments are intact, the lateral. X-rays confirm that, valgus stress is confirmed that, 
and in tech acl you can see bilaterally very well the tibia was horrible and here you need to plan very well so to end up in a not a thicker poly we were able to get over with four millimeter poly on the right side and three on the left and she is doing fantastic so this is a season we are going to have navratri so wish you all a happy navratri in advance as well our experience of almost nine years with uh, 4,000 patients, we had youngest is 34, oldest is 92, obese 135 kg with BMI of 48. And if we see the complication rate, uh, the stiff knee we had one, arthroscopy needed, infection in only two, get over with lavage, no revision needed. One patient ended up in a conversion to rheumatoid, revised to total knee. Tibia fracture in four patients, two patients needed two uh, plating and two patients needed just a conservative treatment. Bearing dislocation in eight patients, uh, reductions were done. In six, two patients needed revision we can, because we could not find the reason of dislocation in these two patients. And anterior knee pain in two patients is rightly mentioned on the lateral facet with a small procedure we needed and lateral compartment progression in only two patients where we need to do for a lateral uni. I will just show you the x-ray uh, of that patient in a case. So overall, uh, complication rate is significantly less in unicompartmental knee. Revision is 3 out of 4,000, and lateral uni means progression of disease 2 out of 4,000. Infection is very rare. This was our own case, had bilateral Oxford. Uh, patient had a trauma. I personally feel this is day one, a little stiff, a little overstuffed uni, and that may be the reason of progression of disease, but uh, the radiologist reported spontaneous ST necrosis uh, of a femur. Uh, so after eight months on a year, she came with a pain and we uh, revised this patient. It was so well fixed on the medial side, we revised with the fixed bearing uni uh, on the lateral side. And outcome, if we talk about the comparisons, uh, theoretically, the both the fixed bearing and mobile bearing unis have served very good. The only thing that matters is revision rate decreases with increased experience of a surgeon. So if it is done well regularly by a surgeon, uh, no matter fixed bearing or mobile bearing, the results are going to give a wonderful outcome at the end. So the take-home message, indications and investigations have inverse relationship in practice of uni. If you do lots of investigation, you will never uh, convince yourself uh, as a surgeon that you can do uni in this patient. Partial knee is a gesture of repair. If we understand this uh, statement, uh, it is definitely not a replacement we are looking for. We are just trying to make kinematics normal through our minimal intervention in one compartment, and that is best appreciated by the patellofemoral joint. Alignment is internal again in uni, while external in total knee. Reproducibility is a very big word uh, in uni, and definitely we are looking for that robotics will make us learn better. It is difficult at this moment to say how it works, but uh, we are hopeful because we are going to have more data. Tibia is terrible, uh, and femur is fantastic. Simple slogan to remember for uni. So better spend time with a uni. Once the TBL cut is done and the TBI is out, almost 90% surgery is already done. Impingement and bearing dislocation both are inherent risk factors in mobile bearing uni. We cannot ignore it, and we have to be very careful for this to avoid complications. So microplasty is actually a space of the best comfort in field of arthroplasty if we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for an excellent talk. Uh, any question from the house? I would like to add one line. Uh, commonly, it's said the success of uni it starts and and in, in the tibia. You have to take the excellent tibia cut, and eighty or ninety percent work is done. Yes, agree, fully agree. The second uh, good point take home, whether you're doing fixed or mobile bearing, is always undercorrect your varus. Never try and overcorrect it. Yes. Uh, so, sir, uh, I think you'll be going to scrub for the surgery. Meanwhile, yes. we can have one or two talks so that sure, we sure. don't waste time. OK, OK. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sachin Bhonsley for uh, his talk on complex primary TKR in and Cairo's knee. Uh, so we can use time, we can rush up. Because ultimately, it, it, it is going to eat from our uh, gala dinner if we get late. <laughs> okay. 
this one is next, this one is by. That's the point. Achha. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah. Hello, friends. I am Dr. Sachin Bhosle from Mumbai. I am going to talk about how to deal with ankylosed knees. Uh, causes of ankylosed knees is osteoarthritis, inflammatory arthritis, including ankylosing spondylitis trauma, infections, infections because of open injury, head injury patients also get ankylosis of various joints, myositis ossificans and some miscellaneous other causes. Most importantly, not to forget, surgically arthrodized knees are also ankylosed. So uh, what's the definition of an ankylosed knee? Any knee with range of motion less than 50 degrees is defined as an ankylosed knee. It doesn't have to be completely bony ankylosed knee can be a painful knee because of fibrous ankylosis. Uh, options can be uh, arthroplasty or corrective osteotomy. It varies, depends upon symptoms of the patient. Indications uh, for arthroplasty in an ankylosis patient is bilateral ankylosis, non-functional position, and painful fibrous ankylosis. Patient has to be counseled very carefully in this. Contraindication. A surgically done uh, arthrodesis is usually difficult to take out. There may not be ligaments, there may not be MCL, and it will be difficult to convert it to a total knee replacement. Poor skin condition, sinuses, or heel scars of sin sinuses is a definite contraindication for uh, a knee replacement in ankylosis. Sequelae of reflex sympathetic dystrophy also mean a bad news and any recent infection is a contraindication to convert an ankylosed knee to a total knee replacement. How to assess? Uh, it's very important because it's not an easy operation. Patient has to be counseled well and assessment to be done correctly is extremely important. It's important to check whether the knee is extended or flexed. In an extended knee, it will be a big struggle, uh, struggle to flex the knee intraoperatively. In a flexion contracture, it will be difficult to balance the knee and you will tend to get an extensor lag following surgery. Soft tissue assessment is important. Check point is scars, sinuses, sinus marks. Shiny, stretched skin, it will be difficult to do a closure following a knee replacement. So consider soft tissue expanders beforehand before embarking on surgery. Doing a CT scan and X-rays is important to check the bone quality, see if there are any cysts or any other problems inside the bone. Most importantly, counsel the patient well, check the expectations, explain the results. These are highly complication-prone procedures. Difficulties. It's not an easy procedure. Uh, in the beginning of your career, please don't take on that. Take some senior colleague or take some, somebody's help to do that. Extensile exposure is required. Joint line identification is a big issue. Patellar tendon can be averse at any stage during the surgery, post-op physiotherapy, or even later on. Intraoperative fractures of tibia, femoral condyles is quite possible. It's extremely easy to get a gap mismatch, especially in a knee which has been fixed in flexion. Uh, collateral ligament injury is possible, making it a difficult scenario to put a standard knee replacement, then you will need a hinge. Mal tracking and mal alignment of extensor mechanism is very common. And uh, often these people have patella baha or you end up proximalizing the joint line, causing a patella impingement on the poly. Wound closure issues, these should be addressed before the surgery. There have been quite a few good papers and uh, Dr. Ashok Rajgopal initially uh, presented a paper with almost 50, uh, 84 knees uh, whom were converted, converted from ankylosis to uh, knee replacement with excellent results. Following that, he again presented 110 knees a uh, few years later and provided a result that total knee arthroplasty and ankylosed knee does achieve excellent correction of deformity with ga uh, gain of good range of motion. So it's quite encouraging, statistical evidence is good, and one needs to do it, one should do it. One more paper here about 82 knees in 99 knees. So total knee replacement gives good midterm results in patient with ankylosed knees. This is by Kim. 
So general soft tissue rules for any knee replacement, mild stiffness, standard release is good, moderate stiffness, you might require a rectus sniff. In an ankylosis, extensor mechanism is a problem. So rectus sniff is something which is a preferred procedure rather than doing a TBL tubercle osteotomy. Skeletonization, that is complete exposure of the femur after doing complete clearance of the gutter is required. Sometimes even rectus snip is not adequate, so a patellar turn down has to be uh, required. Steps, standard medial parapatellar approach is good enough. Cordyceps mechanism is easily damaged so it's important to protect the tbl tubercle mobilize the cords well patella is stuck to the femur in 70 percent of the cases but it's straightforward to separate it with a 10 millimeter osteotome and lever it away from the femoral condyle it's usually stuck to the femoral condyles in the trochlea quadriceps snip is usually required please avoid tbl tubercle osteotomy once the patella is slid laterally uh, important to mobilize the cords, clear the gutters, skeletonize the femur and at that stage you will have to assess if quadriceps snip or VY plasty is required. Do a complete sinoectomy and it's difficult to find the joint line but it's usually 2.5 centimeters distal to the epicondylar axis. After the tibial, femorotibial ankylosis is broken, a small anterior wedge is taken out to do that and the posterior bone left is separated by doing a uh, osteoclasis. Uh, at this stage again assess if quadriceps snip is required. Collaterals and cruciates are normally well preserved in ankylosed knees and choose the implants accordingly. If you have a good stability, good collaterals, you can go for a standard cruciate retaining or posterior stabilized depending upon your preference. But if the MCL is gone, you might have to go for a constraint or a hinge prosthesis. In a fixed flexion deformity type of a knee, it is impossible to do a tibia. It is always better to do, a, do the femur first and always cut the femur plus two millimeter uh, uh, in addition to your primary cut because you are going to get a gap mismatch in an ankylosis TKR, which is stuck in flexion. About gap mismatch, first step we have taken is take more distal femur off. After that, if you still feel that there is going to be a gap mismatch, there is uh, anterior downsizing of femoral component which can be done to further e increase the flexion gap. So you may get somewhat matching flexion and extension gap. Even in spite of that, often the flexion gap is more than the extension gap. If the mismatch is major, you are unable to get a good stability in flexion, better to use a constrained prosthesis. Fixed flexion deformity may not be correctable, might have to be managed by uh, traction post-operatively. Soft tissue release may not be adequate, so sometimes 30 to 40 degrees flexion deformity is left and has to be managed by uh, post-operative traction or plaster and usually a good flexion is achieved in these knees. Decently balanced gaps can be used, uh, if the gaps are decently balanced, you can use a standard CR or PS knee, but if a gap mismatch is significant, you will have to go for constraint processes with rods. So lots of problems here, complication rate is much higher than standard knee replacement. Uh, Dr. Raj Gopal mentioned about 15% complications, but worldwide majority of the studies show at least 30% complication rate. Common complications are skin necrosis, infection, aseptic loosening, periprosthetic fractures. Short term complications are stiffness, wound issues, hematoma formation can be one of a recurrent and tibial tubercle avulsion. Long-term complications are pain, tibia tubercle avulsion, stiffness, loosening, and infection. I got this case here, one patient which I did few years back, uh, who's a 24 years old male, 
and uh, have, was a sickler as well as rheumatoid. You can see that his both knees, especially the left knee, is fixed in almost 90 degrees flexion deformity and right knee in about 45 to 50 degrees flexion deformity. Bony ankylosis, <coughs> hips were okay. So that's his uh, x-ray, pre-operative x-ray, very tiny bones, skeletally mature, although he looks like a kid, uh, only 26 years old. So you can see that the patella is stuck to the femur, completely ankylosed, TBI is sublux posteriorly. This case, I did uh, primary bilateral cruciate retaining total knee replacement and uh, it went on quite well. I got a complete correction of his uh, deformities, as you can see here. That was the pre-operative x-ray and post-operative x-ray and thus him standing and walking following his bilateral total knee replacement for ankylosed knees. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'd like to open the uh, uh, floor to the audience. Any questions? Afternoon. I just wanted to ask, um, in terms of these young patients, um, do you recommend uh, having a revision set at hand or just primary uh, for these patients? I have an 18-year-old uh, young lady Similar x-rays to, to yours, uh, also with uh, ankylosis secondary to um, uh, Gulenberry syndrome. A uh, 18 year old lady with ankylosed knees, if she is ankylosed in extension, I would encourage, encourage her not to do anything because at 18, if we are replacing the knees, uh, we don't know how many times it will need to be revised in a complicated scenario. So if she is ankylosing flexion, osteotomy is one option. If you embark on knee replacement, certainly you will need to have primary set as well as revision set at hand, including hinge and extension rods. So in these kinds of ankylosed knee, do you change patella, resurfacing of patella? Uh, in this particular case, I did not change the patella. The patient was really tiny, but depends. Uh, if the patella is uh, thick, and patella is big, I would definitely want to change the patella. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. So, uh, patient is ready for the surgery. Uh, Dr. Karthik, can you hear us? Yes, uh, yes, I can hear you very well. Uh, can you uh, little uh, tell us a little bit about patient, x-rays, and uh, yes, uh, what, mm -hmm. what implant we are going, going to use? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, male patients, around 50. Uh, this is the x-ray you can see uh, on the screen. Uh, both knee AP standing x-ray uh, uh, on this side. And as it is showing almost bone on bone, we understand this is significant uh, arthritis. So all uh, in our mind is to demonstrate whether we are dealing with a flexible virus. Clinically, it's a flexible virus. We will just uh, go through that. And so valgus stress is taken. Uh, it's a fully correctable valgus. Uh, we can show you the lateral x-ray as well. So, you can see the wear pattern is almost central, you can say, not very anterior, but the central. Patellofemoral joint is good, and I think uh, that indicates that it's a good case for uni we are looking for uh, in this patient. We are going to operate right side first. It's a bilateral case, but we will operate right side first. So, we are going to start that. So the tunicate is applied. Uh, in uni, you always need a tunicate all the time because it is difficult uh, to have a good visualization uh, in uni. Uh, basic landmarks are drawn here. The patella, this is the patella, and this is the tibial tuberosity. So we are going to put an incision. You can have a little bit straight incision also from like this. Uh, I personally like this little oblique incision, so it will give you a good window of soft tissue.
not much fat here. So straight away we'll go down for the arthrotomy. So minimum of fat pad is removed. Just we just want to visualize nothing more than that. Not like TKR. We just need to put our instruments in in the soft tissue window. Entry of one of the because anterior relief on this transmission issue. So, actually, surgery is being conducted in Ahmedabad and uh, being transmitted here. So, you can see this is the only exposure you need. You can have a little bit of anterior fibers of soft tissues just to put your jig and a little bit of fat. So you are going to do Oxford knee? So in uni we don't uh, release the MCL, only from anterior side where we need to put tibial zig, that's all. We don't release MCL at all. We don't remove the medial ossophytes from tibia. Dr. Shukla, can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. So you are going to perform Oxford knee? Uh, we are going to perform a fixed bearing opulent knee. Uh, this fixed is a bearing fixed opulent. bearing Good. design. This is a fixed bearing design. So we are going to remove the anterior osteophytes only in the tibia. That's it. No more osteophytes on the tibial side. Now we are going to remove the femoral osteophytes, which are kinking, and a remnant of anterior horn of medial meniscus, which will just come in my way. That's it. Big medial osteophytes here in this case. Okay, we are good with this. So now, when it comes to the tibia, we all agree that tibia is a difficult situation. Uh, I think sir, the, sir. most of the companies are giving this kind of jigs till date, uh, which is uh, difficult to use uh, uh, in a uni. I personally feel uh, it can't work in any way. You can't do anything with this jig. Uh, it is too difficult and too bulky. And second missing part uh, in a whole procedure is a spoon or a, or a spacer in between to see your MCL. And that is what is available with Oxford knee. Uh, soon the fixed bearing design will have a wonderful instrumentation. First time that we will have all these things or features in fixed bearing design to see the things. So this spacer is just to stretch my MCL so that 
there is a proper tissue tension and I will not inadvertently cut my tibia more. This is distracting. So I am okay with this. I will accept this. If I am loose, I will go for a higher size. So the whole idea is to fill the gap between the tibia and femur in flexion and distract the tibia down and have a proper MCL tension uh, around the medial side. Here it is good, rock solid. So I will accept this. Uh, sorry for interrupting, Dr. Shukla. Can, can you show the house ACL, intact ACL yes, in the lateral is. compartment? Because yes, uh, yes. it's for a young surgeon who want to learn uni that we can easily see. So, artery, please. Cameramen so, need to focus. Yeah. This is the lateral compartment. I think uh, I need to externally rotate more. This is the pristine lateral compartment. This is even the synovial covering of ACL is intact. So there is a lot of worries around the arthritis that something goes very scary inside and dangerous inside. Believe me, uh, the nature is so forgiving and you will end up in a shocking, wonderfully uh, little compartment ACL even when you had predicted a scary situation on table. So this is a case by x-ray. I think so many would have preferred that this seems an in extended indication of uni, but this is just in a center of, you can say, where you can offer this patient wonderful partial knee. And do you need to remove osteophytes from the medial side of the lateral femoral condyle? Yes, uh, in, in the uh, all area? cases, in all cases, uh, we remove the osteophyte on the lateral side uh, of uh, medial side of a lateral femoral condyle because it is going to have a decapitating effect on ACL, and that is, uh, I think, termed as Mary Antoinette syndrome. So well done uni, but if that osteophyte is not removed, your uni will definitely have ACL deficiencies in a little bit of time, and then uni have a high chance that that uni may fail. So this is, I am going to use an Oxford jig here. A wonderful jig is on our way. Very soon we will have that for fixed bearing design as well. Uh, I would like to tell House that we are going to do fixed uni, uh, opulent uni by Merrill. Uh, this tibia zig is from Oxford, he is using. Uh, I personally feel this is little more, so there is nothing or no wrong or no harm in a recut. I will go for plus two, so I will cut little less tibia. So that is the whole idea to preserve as much tibia as possible. Yeah. So we are going to have a plus two tibia. I'm going to mark my trajectory, anthroposterior trajectory, with thin osteotome, anything you can use. The whole idea is you will have an understanding to have an ACL insertion here, the most medial fiber or the medial tibial eminence, and I would like to bisect this medial tibial eminence to have a proper thick and wider tibia. So the plane of cut, so many confusion that it may, you may go like this, you may go like this. Believe me, there is hardly any, any, any space at the back. And being an arthroplasty surgeon, we know that if, even if you add a five degree here or five degree there, it's not going to much, much sense. But you have to have a plane of action. Yeah, normally there is just a bit of space. You can't uh, angle and it much. Second important thing, you should not cut tibia like this. Means your, your hand should not be lifted. So you don't want to cut posterior tibia at the back of here. So you just want to be flush with your jig. So vertical cut is done. So vertical cut should be just adjacent to ACL. We should be yes. as towards the center as possible. Yes, uh, yes. Even 10% of fibers of ACL can be removed. It should be so towards the center. And one other trip is to try and aim the saw towards the center of the femoral head. That usually gives you a good plane. So uh, if anybody has any query, please ask, uh, stand and ask, including the surgery also. We'll try to resolve that. Uh, uh, so there is a question. Mm. Is surgery being conducted in a normal TKR position or with the uh, leg dangling from a hanger? This is a TKR position we had chose in this particular uh, fixed bearing design. Oxford we always do in uh, 
hanging leg position invariably. So the tibia is out and you can see very well the entire area affected here to here. This is complete loss of cartilage. Yeah, posterior cartilage me? is intact. Yes, posterior cartilage is intact. And if you see from the side, if you have a good tibial cut, you have bisected the medial mountain, it will be uh, the tallest portion in the center of your tibial cut. So this is a proper cut we have. Um, quick question, sir. What was the slope that you put on the uh, cut? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, in uh, fixed bearing design, the slope is difficult to reproduce through manual instruments. You just have to judge or guess, I can say. Uh, you can plan from x-rays, you can template it, but the only way I personally believe is to have some system like navigation or anything, robotics, which will help you to have a reproduction of your T-bell slope. In a fixed bearing, design, in mobile bearing design, you don't need to do that because it is from minus three, means three degree reverse slope to seven degree uh, T-bell slope is all that is acceptable by proven by the papers. So all the time we use seven degree slope when we use a mobile bearing unit. So this is my flexion gap. Uh, I'm going to measure my flexion gap. So I'm tight. So that's exactly I wanted to show. This usually happens when you are loose, no problem. This is very tight. This is the minimum gap we have to fill our flexion gap with the tibia and the poly. So what I have an option now is to go for a recut of tibia or I have an option to go in femur. I had already removed the tibial jig because to cut tibia is a bad idea in uni. Curly Wurly, please. So there are two ways, uh, three ways you can say. You will just take, again, evaluate your osteophytes. If they are still there, you can take their osteophytes in the femur. Whether they are kinking, yes, it was kinking a little bit, my MCL. And I will plan to have a posterior tibial cut for sure in this case. So the jig has taught us a right tibial cut, but I really wanted to have stronger tibia. And so I will go for a femoral free hand cut in this case. You can use a thinner bone file also. The whole idea is to generate a flexion gap between the femur and tibia. Uh, question, doctor. For a starter surgeon, is this technique something you would advise or would you advise them to recut the tibia? Pardon? For uh, somebody who's starting off with unicompartmental, if they find their flexion gap is tight, mm. uh, what would you advise? So, uh, yeah, uh, depending on the case. See, uh, honestly, uh, there are 54 ways you can cut the tibia. So, depending on the patient's BMI, activity level, indication, and the quality of bone, you can choose out of 54 the right option in a medial compartment uni. So I'm, I think, very happy now with the tibial cut. So this is going very smooth. Even I would like to have a little bit of smoothness more on the flexion gap. So I will use, again, a little bit of bone file. See now, this is, this is so practical. So if you put the knee like this, you will cut with a less pressure. If you externally rotate and take, you will have more bone cut. We all know that. So this is more grinding effect and going to take bone from both the sides, tibia as well as femur. Watch this. Flexion gap again. I am very well done with my flexion gap. So my minimum flexion gap is done in 90 degree. So I had planned eight millimeter, which is the thinnest. So now we are going to check the extension gap. 
Naturally, no. because the cartilage is gone in the distal femur, it has to be loose. Hardly there is any possibility you will have same if the femoral cartilage is not that bad, but never tight. So we are going to have more thicker. So minimum is 8 mm. Yes, my flexion gap is 8. And my extension gap, I think, let me check one more. This is 10, full extension. I think I am very well with this. So this is 10. So my flexion gap is 8, and my extension gap is 10. So the idea is to fill the gap with the distal jig by putting the shims. So there are, there are different ways you can put. But here, our TBL cut is so precise. So we are going to add the femoral jig plus 2. So this is plus 2. The whole idea is to make 10. So we are going to make it 10. And we are going to have the extension gap reproducibility. So this is, again, uh, manually, it is difficult to reproduce this uh, uh, alignment in flexion and extension axis. But full extension is a time when you can accept. I think, again, here, the technology is really uh, good to use to have a reproducibility through robotics or navigation so that you can plan uh, exact placement of your distal femoral cutting jig. Full extension, done. So, so we are going to fix this with pin. Again, I think uh, the concern is going to give you a size between of your spacer. Curly wall is a spike, please. In Oxford, there is an intermediate uh, rod we need to put uh, for the femur. Uh, in fixed bearing, uh, mostly uh, we don't uh, need to go inside femur. Always protect your ligaments. Full extension, please. And uh, because of uh, small incision, we you need very good hemostasis. And yes. uh, pulse rod is really helpful uh, to clear the debris again and again and make your life easy on the table. Okay. So hardly any bone is cut or uh, there is significant? Very less amount of bone is cut from the distal femur. Dr. Shukla, uh, uh, this distal femur cut, we are taking in extension. How you make sure that saw doesn't go too posterior yeah. dangerous, dangerously? Uh, you How have you to go for a woodpecker method, I can say. Uh, just go on feeling and go. You can leave it uh, uh, means incomplete at the end also. And you can take uh, inflection as well, Yeah. like this. So if it is left uh, not cut proper, you can use flexion gap flexion position, and then you can take a distal femur cut again in the most posterior aspects. The spike pin, curly volume. Spike, please. So, guys, this Actually, is MCL retractor. Uh, it's known as curly whirly also. It's from Oxford side. Excellent instrument. Yes. So, please. So, this is a difficult situation in instrumentation is fixed bearing implant that this this is you have to have this portion little bit uncut so now we are going to measure our extension gap spacer
I think we are good with this. It's it's uh, ten or eight now. This is ten. This is ten. Okay, this is. We are going to check extension. Okay. So we are good with this. I think there is some bone left. So this is 8 mm or this is 10 mm? This is 8 mm. This is 8 mm. And same we will have in flexion. So this is 8 here in flexion. And same we are going to have in extension. So this is the minimum thickness uh, of poly and the minimum gap you want to create in flexion and extension gap. So this is wasn't it I'm loose earlier uh, in extension 8 mm was loose I think mm, I don't think I will accept a little bit of under correction rather than going for overstuffing uh, the middle compartment so let's see how it goes further sizing Seamer. Okay, okay. So 90. So this is very big. Four. So there are how many sizes of the femur implants? One to six. One to six. So you are sizing femur now? Yes, yes. I am sizing femur as well as orienting my femur. Because here it is left and right different femurs we have. Three. I think now the sizing of uh, femur is critical here and useful in a way you can use the meniscus line to size your femur and you have to put it around center or a little bit of lateral but never medial and left and right are different in uh, fixed bearing design. So you have to see where your femur is ending. You can mark it with a cautery and then you can use this instrumentation as well. So this looks nice to me. Uh, can Cameraman focus? Uh, on yes, the I will just remove the handle. Upper part of femur, it. so that we can clearly see how we decide about the size of femur. Yes. So where it is ending is the line that the, in full extension the meniscus has called created a dent where you can put this the anterior most aspect of your femoral jig. Spike please. So again you have to reconfirm. I think this is not a good position. I am too lateral. I will change it. So in uh, femur uh, placement also, the implant should be more towards the center, more lateral, yes, as, yes, lateral yes. as possible. Hey, so remove this again. Handle please. Yes, this is a good position. It's a very broad femur today. Not always it is broad in all the cases. So you have to be very careful with seeing the medial and lateral. Done. Hmm. Done. So we are now very good.
So we are in a good position in the femur. Now we are going to have the cuts. There are two cuts, that is posterior condylar cut and the chamfer cut, posterior chamfer cut, and the two peg holes. The, the posterior cut is when you've got to be careful that the MCL retractor is not slipped. So if I were you starting off, I would reposition the retractor. Again. In this system, there is a stop at the back, so you will not cut the tibia when you are going for the posterior chamfer cut. In please, remove. So we are good in a lateral half of the condyle because if you go medial, the stress distribution is so asymmetric because the femur will go in internal rotation in full extension and it will have a lot of pressure on the medial side. So posterior cut is done and the chamfer is also done. I need to take a little bit of bone on the medial side. Nibbler, please. The bone is really, really very hard uh, on uni, uh, in uni cases because the moment we say medial compartment arthritis, there has to be subchondral sclerosis. So wash, please. And uh, trial, please. And the tibial sizing you will do. We'll start with the meniscus also later on, but we'll just try to see the balancing. The femur, just the feel of a gap. No, 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 not this. Opposite, this. And the tibia, yes, tibia. Tibia, this is tibial cut, original tibial cut. Just to show the sizes, how it works, you can measure. Give me more and more size of tibia. So this is where you can measure uh, the sizes uh, from your tibial cut, anteroposterior and mediolateral. You have to match everything, but anteroposterior is very important. Mediolaterally, you can play with a little bit of medialization of your uh, implant. So this looks little good five looks good to me let us do this in this system we have to do this first i think then only we will be able to get the trials we can check with this so this is eight in this system so good i think not too tight a little bit of tight i will i would say this is still little tight I would take a tibial bone slurry and extension, full extension please. So again, uh, there is nothing like you are loose, you are still tight actually. So I would like to have a tibial cut, little bit bone file and then I will use the minimum size thickness of a poly and the tibial base plate. So let's have this removed, implant. We will have a slurry of bone from the tibia. Okay. Wash, please. So, anyone from delegates doing unis on a regular basis? Or have done few? Good. So, any, any queries or any kind of discussion we can have here? It, it gives uh, such satisfying results that uh, 
your uni patient brings so many other patients uh, number of times they bring their relatives or uh, friends for uh, uni uh, and i tell uh, that you are not candidate for uni you need to get undergo total knee so uh, their response is like oh my, I, I really have to convince that total knee is also a good surgery it's not a bad surgery so <laughs> uni is a little better so we are going to take a meniscus and I think this is very important step so that you do not release more and cause damage to your collateral. Yes. Flex now. Good. We will use a retractor, Kelpie. Kelpie, Kelpie. This is fine. So the posterior horn is very, very, very tight, hold this. Fine. So while moving medial meniscus, we uh, keep a bit of uh, it intact, uh, one or two millimeter. Uh, especially in mobile bearing, it has been observed that uh, otherwise uh, that moment poly may cause a little bit of pain. If it is a little bit of uh, middle meniscus intact on the middle side with the MCL, so that is uh, there are less chances right. of that in pain. Right. One more. So the tibia, you can use the cut. At this moment, there are keels. Uh, they're going to be a spacer uh, properly designed for uh, measuring like a hook you can use so that you can have a proper preparation of a tibia. So tackles, please. Hold this. So there are two peg holes. Just a minute. So you have sized the tibia or you're doing it now? Yes, yes, yes. Tibial sizing. This is the tibial sizer actually with a keel. So these are the keels that rests on the bone and you can impact uh, if you want a little bit with a impactor. You can impact a little bit of tibia. So the keel will go in and it will I think we need moon. to see end on, uh, like cameraman needs to show us from little, little bit of higher uh, side. Yeah, I'll yeah. just remove the handle and then you can easily see. Good. Done. And we'll put, so this is the two peg holes in this design. very hard bone 
one and two refractor please yes okay and the third one is a little bit of compressor or you can say a little bit of keel in a soft bone the tibia is actually all the time divided into hard bone on a medial half and the soft bone on the lateral half in almost all cases leave it leave it you don't need it so this is a keel hammer it so the biggest advantage is here you don't need a toothbrush that is an advantage this is safe this is very safe to prepare tibia so oxford is very challenging uh, when you do a uh, tibial preparation so this is done there are two peg holes beautifully designed medially anterolaterally and a soft cancellous impactor kind of thing that what we use in thr wash please Uh, would you have the final trials now? Yes, yes, we are going to have the final trials. So the femur. It's fine. We will see, we have removed the meniscus. If it is increasing my gap, I have not yet touched the tibia to do a little bit of bone file or anything. So we are just relying on the perception of our meniscus. I think uh, that is a good thing. So never cut the bone. When you release the meniscus, it will give you a good space. And this can go very nicely into the flexion. And same way, we will try to reproduce that in extension. And we are a bit, little bit of tight in extension, you can say. Five degree flexion, we are a bit tight. So this is the thing, this is really tight. So we cannot accept this extension gap. So flexion, I am fine. Extension, I am tight, a uh, little bit of tight. So I will go for a recut in the distal femur. Remove this. So tibial femoral jig. Yes, sir. Yes. We'll use. Extension, please. So the whole idea is to have a one more millimeter of uh, the distal femur we would like to come cut from the instrumentation. So you are taking a 2 mm recut from the distal femur? Yes. Hmm. You can uh, have better extension gap feel is very important you cannot ignore it so both the gaps flexion and extension are going to make sense and the bone is really very sclerosed in this patients so you can have little bit of undercut like what we have seen in our T tibia in tkr so i'm going to have a plus two retractor to protect my mcl Nilish. Fine. Mm -hmm. We are done. In please. For, uh, for all the young surgeons, I would like to say that it may be looking a little difficult or complex kind of surgery, but if you learn it, get yourself trained, you can do it, everyone can do it. Uh, I think for an accomplished knee surgeon, you should know so HTO, 
uh, uni, total knee and revisions Darshan. in all sort of uh, situations, I must say. And uh, uh, that, that, that would be best for your patients and uh, yourself. And, the bone uh, is really in the industry, is, and industry is really helpful. Uh, they are doing, they are conducting S2S programs, surgeon to surgeon programs. They are taking uh, young people to the p uh, persons who are doing unis on a regular basis. So everyone can learn it. One, I just want to drill bit, free hand, just to match my holes. Yes, free, on, on hand, on hand. Just to match my peg hole, because this is very important. Yes, thank you. We are uh, regularly doing mobile bearing uh, cases. So we are so, so well versed with that instrumentation. So we are fine. We have matched this. And the pin again. Little bit of extension, please. Oh, yes. Yeah. Done. We can remove this. Very good. We'll just check the gaps again. No, that is fine. That is not going to change. It's the only thing that we have to deepen the peg holes, two millimeter drill holes, femoral peg holes. And we will check the chamfer cuts again. So, Dr. Vivek Mittal, uh, what's your experience with uni? Can you please tell or guide us a bit? Pardon? No, no, we are talking here only. Okay. We are done. Excellent implant, but I am really happy with mobile bearing. And I've tried initial fixed bearing, not happy. The precision in mobile bearing is very good. Had he been using mobile bearing, this problem wouldn't have happened, even in a tough bone, because of the reaming technique. And the same th thing I feel in total knee also, wherever they've used a reamer to cut a bone, it has given us precision, like Smith and Ifunis, notch cut. Very precise, very precise. And I've been really? happy. Lately, I'm not doing it because most of the people come for TKR. And uh, uh, otherwise, it's a wonderful implant. Stop and it. I feel most of the surgeon feels that their uni is going to last 15 years plus now. Like in totally, we feel it's going to last more than 25 years. So in another few years, they will have almost the same as TKR. Thank you, sir. Fine. Wash, please. good with the flexion gap and even still we are still tight with the extension gap I think a little bit of tight extension gap it is too tight still too tight now give me tibia and the trial in between with that so we may have a feel and one minute, I would like to use that opposite side poly of this eight with this, so we can we cannot much in this. 
again remove the implant and check the gaps again. So I think uh, uh, it is very well that the reproducibility and uh, consistency with the mobile bearing is one of the ease I feel is a uh, hanging leg position that is very easy. Only one assistance and you can get away with the surgery consistently every single time. This is easy for uh, conversion to TKR if you want or you, you have in mind. So this is really nice. Extension, please. Uh, in case of total knee, commonly we create uh, extension gap first and uh, then produce a flexion. We match it. Uh, it's other way around in uni. First flexion gap, then we match the extension gap with that. So we are actually very nice here with the sizing uh, when we do this. I think this may be more congruent or maybe the position. This is 8 and this is also 8. So we are very nice with the gaps uh, in this uh, blocks. So we can get away with the minimum tibia with this. So we will accept this and let me have a original implant. Let's start mixing, I think. Uh, and anyone has experience with the revision of uni in failed cases? Uh, would you like to say something? Three. Please, please take mic uh, if it is there. I've done about four revisions. Now, with uh, mobile wearing, what happens is a great, great system, very nice instruments, provided you've been taught, uh, you've gone through the course properly. It's not something you can start one day uh, on your own and do it. Again, it'll be a very messy system if you do it on your own. Second thing with mobile bearing, there is a certain percentage of bearing dislocation and it's not uh, the surgery dependent because it doesn't happen immediately in the post-operative period. It can happen two years later, no, three years know. later as well. So that is the only drawback with the mobile bearing system. And once that happens, you have to revise. So again, it's difficult enough to explain to the patient why it dislocated, what did they do wrong, because as a surgeon, you've been encouraging them to do everything and not restrict their activities. And that's why you encourage them to do, undergo a unicondylar knee replacement in the first place. Now, um, I've done a couple of conversions from UKR to TKR as well. Not a very difficult uh, aspect because once you cut the rest of the uh, lateral condyle of the tibia, the difference is hardly a millimeter or so on the medial side and I've never needed to use a, a augment there. Yeah. But I would, uh, for, uh, for a couple of cases I have used stem extensors in them. But technically it doesn't take time or it's not difficult. Yeah, no. uh, <clears throat> I would like to share my experience. I've total done uh, six revisions in last eight or nine years. Uh, out of those six, I've used Augment only on one. And uh, uh, in two, I did CR knees. And uh, in all the six, the uh, insert was just 9 mm. I've used stems in every one, all the uh, uh, TBS. Because uh, after okay. one failed surgery, I can't uh, uh, see another failure if there is medial collapse. And uh, out of all, these only one was uh, because of indication for revision was uh, uh, mobile dis dislocation only in one in eight years or out of uh, 300 unis oxfords and uh, in fix it was edge loading and uh, if i see retrospectively it was uh, uh, most of the patient it was my error i can say as surgeon uh, maybe because of initial days that's the learning curve i must say but still, uh, after doing so many, uh, as I told earlier, still at this stage also in 15 to 20% of cases, in spite of best of my trials to prevent edge loading, still will get it. So uh, that's a little bit of problem. <laughs> but uh, uh, revision is very okay. easy. Actually, it's very easy. Uh, we can use the cut from lateral tibia or from the femur as bone graft, use screws, and have used uh, uh, tibia stems for more stability, if we can say. 
and uh, recovery is really fast. It's it's not like normal disease. It's like uh, primary totally, and uh, people are in general happy, very happy. Just want so to this, add. This is the femoral implant. Uh, the surface area is now you can see a very very congruent kind of a surface area, not a round. So the post-operative X-ray, the the worry we do have in a fixed bearing is an age loading or a linear wear uh, at one place. So this is very flat implant and left and right properly curved, uh, coated also. So beautiful pockets of uh, cement you can put uh, in chamfer and distal, and a very well designed uh, peg holes also to have a good uh, grip of cement. Uh, when you put this implant, the tibia yeah. is nice. again uh, left and right. So this is the tibia uh, coated again. This is interesting to see the pockets designed very well for the cements. Two pegs again designed according to the forces to neutralize. And this is what I was talking about is the keel that goes automatically like an impactor in the cement mantle. So it will sit like this, and the keel will sit there. So this is, again, to have a good cementing around your peg holes, which is, a, again, a worry for a fixed bearing design. So we will do the cementing now. Yeah, we are waiting. Yes, sir. Yeah, one thing you mentioned, but I think I'll re-emphasize. Whenever one is doing a revising, you need to a total always use stem because in two cases which I revise, later they went into further virus subluxation probably because of osteonecrosis of the uh, residual tibial area. And uh, it's sad that UKR, failure, revision, total, and then further. So That's stem different. usage, I think it should be emphasized whenever you're doing a total revision. It really makes sense and prevent future complications. So just talk us, talk us through your cementing te technique and advice for the audience, sir. So the cement mantle should be very thin. I think that is very important. You don't need a lot of cement in UKR. You can uh, finish the two pegs holes with the syringe. You can use 2cc syringe. And the tibia. You Very do less. always tibia first or femur first in uni? You can do whatever you want to do, but tibia is going to be easy uh, and you can use tibia. In Oxford, you have to do tibia first as a rule. Here, you can have a possibility, but again, it will reduce a lot of space. So if you do the tibia first as a rule, it will make sense because it is easy to put implant uh, in a narrow space. Again, apply very less cement uh, under surface of implant you don't need a lot of cement because then it will move here and there yeah. and it will create a problem so, of removal i am asking for the audience why in oxford uh, it's rule uh, to put tibia first just easy i think it's too yeah we uh, need to remove cement posteriorly, posteriorly yeah. so it's much easier uh, after putting Even the um, easy to put impact and yeah yeah uh, that, and that's also one of the reasons difficult with Very nice. So if you do not put much cement, very less amount of cement will come out. Otherwise, it's a problem to remove cement from the back of a tibia. So the instrument he is using is Woodson Curate? Yes, it's, it's a Woodson. It's a uh, I think one of the best instruments in orthopedics I have seen. No doubt about it. <laughs> to my statement, the day you will start using it, you will realize it. Flex a bit.
So it looks beautiful, looks like the real gold. <laughs> yes. Again, we will check the tibia. Push it. Done. So I don't know about the Ahmedabad, but in uh, North India, especially Punjab, people are really fascinated by the name gold. Gold. <laughs> Done. So it's now you can see the congruence has increased a lot in this design than the previous designs. Even though it's a fixed bearing design, there is a lot of congruence you can see and feel uh, throughout range of motion. Maybe the radius is so large now that there's a lot of contact between the femur and tibia from full extension to the good full flexion. And no matter what I had observed, you will always get a cement. How, how hard you put a hammer, the ligament is going to give you the best cement removal, whether it's a fixed bearing or mobile bearing, you will get the additional cement out, if at all required. So this is the end you can have here, you don't need to see the impingement in mobile bearing. You always need to see whether the poly is hitting the anterior cortex of a femur. And you can see the very well patellar femoral joint also. Medial facet has some changes here, but the lateral facet, and you can see everything from this small incision. See, there is always a worry for the surgeon that we will be able to see. Yes, you can see everything from this small incision. It's a mobile tissue window. You can use flexion and extension in the range of motion accordingly. In Oxford, mobile bearing, you, you allow 45 degrees to settle down the cement. Here, it is always full extension. Uh, you settle down the cement just like what we do in TKR. Any questions uh, we need to answer? Or yeah, you can yeah, carry on with the your audience. schedule. But in fix, uh, is there any uh, possibility to increase the extension gap more after this? I think you would find that he was—he actually recut two millimeters. So there are spigots you can use, um, shims. Rather, sorry, he used a shim initially, two millimeter shim to move the joint line distally to tighten it. Um, so uh, because it was tight, he then had to go back to where he was before. So he actually recut the distal tibia of femur. Basically, it's a recutting of distal femur. In fixed bearing, you we, you uh, use a saw. In uh, Oxford, we use the rimmers. Uh, I just like to add something uh, for this. Uh, you had seen uh, the difference between these two. Uh, we do almost uh, a lot of mobile bearing unis uh, in and out in a day, almost like you can say 80 to 100 mobile bearing unis. But you can see, even I am not comfortable uh, today because the instrumentations. Uh, what we use in Oxford is different than what we are using in here. As rightly mentioned, the milling pattern is uh, too beautiful and you can increase your extension gap a millimeter. So my personal uh, statement, I can say that I would love to do all my fixed bearing units with robotics only. So that is my personal perception. Uh, there is no data or anything I had till date. But uh, mobile bearing unit it is easy to do a mobile bearing unit once learned very well. Uh, you will not believe that the learning curve is little, little long, but then at the end you will enjoy. Like you can finish uh, your mobile bearing unit consistently in every single case within 20 minutes or 25 minutes very easily, very comfortably. Uh, we will plan that someday uh, when next time we will have a live uh, surgery, but it is reproducible. So robotics in fixed bearing uni is of very much interest to understand how it is going to help uh, with milling. That is, I think, the best part in mobile bearing or fixed bearing uni. You can have all the data of your axis, uh, your correction of your axis, flexibilities of lateral, collateral, and that's a way forward we are looking for uh, with a robotics and a fixed bearing design, how it works, uh, just like as a mobile bearing uni, 
where I personally at this moment don't feel any need of any robotics because it is very, very reproducible with a 0.3 millimeter precision at your fingertips. So that may be my personal perception. Uh, larger series or longer data time will be uh, going to give us a good information when a lot of surgeons are doing the surgeries. We will have uh, data from our Indian patients which will be of immense help to us learn better and better. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, such a nice surgery, Dr. Shukla, in spite of the different instrumentation. And you're very right, robotics have a big role. Uh, it's much more in uni as compared to total knee. Uh, actually, the ro robots were started for uh, unis, and uh, Mako was probably the first one. Am I right? Yes, and, uh, agree. So on that note, we say uh, goodbye to Dr. Shukla, and we can carry on with our uh, rest of the uh, talks here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, may I uh, want to invite Dr. Mani Samsung and Dr. Murukan Babu to move on with the next session, please? to moderate with the next session. Uh, after those live surgeries, uh, we move on to where we left behind the primary total knee replacements. And uh, now may I call upon Dr. Uh, Vivek Mittal uh, for managing bone defects in primary TKR. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm from Delhi. I'm working at BL Kapoor Max Hospital, and I would like to share my thoughts regarding managing the bone defects in primary total knee replacement. As the time passes and as you get into more and more these joint surgeries, you will realize that the defects bone you encounter in primary surgeries are quite not far different from division surgeries. So they are not uncommon, though we don't have an exact figure. And though you see a full femoral condyle defect, but they are rare to see in primary total knee, most of them are incomplete condyle defects. And in this case, not only you see a full femoral condyle defect in rheumatoid, you see two large tibial condylar defects as well. Compared to femur, tibial is definitely far more leading in primary mode defects, and the reason is mechanical. If you see bone defect, well, you know it's a deformity which is severe. If the defect increases, to your eyes, definitely there is an instability issue or ligament compromise issue and probably the need for a constrained implant. You must counsel patient that functional outcome will be there, good, but definitely going to take long time. And you have to worry your surgical techniques so that you can give good 
longevity to the implant. It's still the most common cause is primary OA and of course osteonecrosis, trauma, infections, osteotomy and condyles, uh, neoplasms are other reasons. But long-standing uh, deformity and osteopenia uh, leads to mechanical malalignment and overload leads to collapse of the medial tibial condyle. And the sliding motion is replacing the rollback motion and it keeps on adding to the defect further and further and further. Well, these are the common aims for surgery, but in bone defects, what is more important is creating a stable platform where the proper load transfer to the host bone can occur. And this is the key to longevity. If this does not happen, you are going to have a failure sooner or later. And this is what I meant. Uh, look at this gentleman. Well, tibial defect, medial, as you see on the AP view, and of course, compared to the anterior, there's a post medial defect. This is what I did, a Vanguard implant and two screws. Well, he was very happy. And this is how he came five years later to me, that whole thing collapsed because, well, the defect was much more than 30, 35 percent and I just use screw instead of additional stabilization factor and it has to be revised to a fully constrained implant. Uh, most of the time you are able to see the defects on x-ray and in the time of digital x-rays where most of the films are small, luckily most of the x-rays are done in the hospital. If they are done, you can all the time calculate the defect which is there on the computer screen. But sometime they are not seen to your eyes or you are not careful enough to see them at your eyes. So defects can sometimes be seen when you least expect them. And believe me, even if you are seeing on x-ray, they are always worse than anticipated. Because you only see two-dimensional image on an x-ray on the table, it gives you a full three-dimensional image as you see here. Well, and classification is this, uh, used for primary and revision uh, cases, but I use something very simple, contained, if contained, uh, tibial or femoral, and then peripheral or uncontained, tibial or femoral, then percentage, and how much is anterior and posterior part of the tibial condyle is intact, which let me help decide how it is going to be. Contained defects are not an issue. Uh, most of the time, if they are valgus, it's a rheumatoid knee, lateral tibial condyle is there, tibial components are usually stable. You can use bone graft from the bone cuts of the femoral sites and the tibial sites, but, or you can use a bone cement. But a simple caveat, if after resection, you find it is going beyond 10 centimeters, 10 millimeters, sorry, not centimeters, always add tibial stem for stability. And if you are using an implant which does not have a long keel, for example, Genesis 2TB have a longer keel compared to many other implants, think of using a stem. It helps in stability for a long term. Contained defects on medial sites are uncommon. As you see here, as you see there, and but if they are, again, uh, nothing much to worry. You can use bone graft or cement depending on the situation. If the uh, host surface is good, Use bone graft, otherwise bone cement. Uncontained defects are always a challenge and one should be careful when they are seeing it. Most of the time they are present on medial tibial condyle, but you will be surprised to see them on lateral tibial condyle also and they are equally difficult. Now, if they are present, most of the time tibial base is totally sclerotic and which makes it difficult for you to imagine ki, well, a bone gram should be done or not, it's such a sclerotic bone. And not only how you're going to uh, take care of it, how to add to the stability of the tibial component, especially in deep flexion activities of Iranian patients is always a thought a surgeon should have. Now look at this tibia here, and I have just used a uh, undersized tibia, which is virtually totally covering the tibial defect. But look at here, I have used uh, tibia and this is the one which actually, uh, this is not the one, this is another one which failed, a large posteromedial defect screw alone 
does not help, right? So you must understand that defects should be evaluated, especially after cutting the tibia, as much desired uh, tibial resection is done, and then after planning and preparing the tibia, how much the defect is left. Well, you can use multiple techniques, and which one to choose? Well, depends. Size of bony defect, expectancy and age of the patient, how is the bone quality, and whether after dealing with it is stable or not, the trial component. These three slides are the most important thing for me to decide what to do. This is the whole tibial surface and mediolateral surface, this defect is almost, almost taking care of the 80% of the medial tibial condyle. Well, this is another view from the sides. You see the defect is almost in the 60%, but you see a very good quality of bone anteriorly and posteriorly, which is ready to take care of the tibial surface and not going to fail. And thirdly, even after cutting, how deep and how sclerotic is the tibial uh, condylar defect? And these three things will, uh, this is a very basic slide, uh, but this is a very important slide. Once you understand this, I think the rest of the story become easy, whatever you want to use, whichever way you want to use. Resection at depth, I think of 13, 14, 15 years, this was the most common thing. Uh, such an old slide, you see that there is a defect much beyond, uh, almost uh, 10 millimeters beyond uh, the resection surface and we have used a very large poly, 20 mm poly. Uh, this is a next gen uh, implant. <coughs> this is another example and remember this because this is one side of the patient, I have used this and I will come and talk about another, uh, the left side after some time. And here after cutting the implant, you undersize the tibia and it has given a very stable fixation. So I have done little extra cut and then use a smaller tibia to give a stable implant. But resection at depth is something one should never follow unless one has nothing much to do and there is very little you can do other than that. And if you are cutting too much bone, it often leads to instability and this is what you often get. Uh, so avoid cutting uh, more than 10 millimeter of bone from good side or maybe 11, 12, but not beyond that. Otherwise, not only the quality of bone you lose, the size of tibia you lose, the uh, mismatch between the tibial and femoral component you make, but tissue stability also you lose. Lateralization and smaller component, yes, you can do. If it is possible, it is doable, but there is a limit to you, 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 you can't reduce size 4 tibia to size 1 tibia. You can just at best do 1. And if you are ready to comprise more, the other may be slightly out. So you must understand that uh, once you even uh, undersize the tibia and still there is a defect, it should not be more than 5 millimeter. Definitely not more than 5 millimeter because that you can build up with cement. This is an example of that. Is cement alone is a choice? Yes, it is a choice if it is a central defect or it is a small peripheral defect which is not through and through anteroposteriorly. It is a small peripheral defect somewhere in between anterior and posteriorly and even after trial there is a no instability. That's a good choice. Is this a good example of using a cement as a filler? Well, of course, in today's time, no. 15 years back, okay. but leaving that much amount of defect with cement, it's, 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 it's asking for trouble and this is one patient who may not be very happy after some time. Well, uh, uh, it's coming to, what about the screws? Well, not many lectures, not many th uh, papers, but Mary Little has a very good paper with a very long follow-up where he used uh, almost 17, 18 years or more follow-up of screws and cement. And again, if you are using a screw alone, the size should not be more than half. We now have reduced it to not more than 30 percent. And if it is more than 30 percent, well, then use cement. And look at this tibia example. This blue color is made just to show the size of defect. So the defect is in the central part of the tibia. Well, very good for screw fixation uh, alone. But had it been more from where the arrows are, then of course you require something else, either a bone graft or a stem for this. A screw alone, 
as you see well this is a small defect which could come out of bone anteriorly and posteriorly to support the tibia screw with tibial stem fixation is a good choice this is certainly a bad choice i'm saying because this is one where you have to be careful posteromedial instability is worse and the posteromedial forces are one and this is an example with screws alone a patient 64 years bilateral tkr and look at this patient horrible x-rays both sides severe defect severe deformity both sides and i have followed him for almost 15 years now well this is what a screw alone on one side and bone graft with stem on other side and the reason was the amount of defect on two different sides and the both implants are serving well what about the bone graft well sounds logical biologic well it allows uh, augmentation of the residual bone stock it on physiological loading well it becomes stronger and stronger with type you can take care of peripheral and central defect you don't have to pay any extra cost except the cost of screws and you can contour the graft if possible on the table well the disadvantages are the sclerotic bone if it is well you are very not sure about whether it is going to unite or not and if the surface is not oblique or not little horizontalish if it is more vertical well then the graft union becomes an issue because it uh, the amount of forces on this are too high and the alignment of the component has to be very good with bone graft if there is a varus uh, malalignment they fail early and you have to be very very careful when uh, doing the cementing because you have to prevent cement from seeping between the bone graft and the host bone and there are the few examples you uh, you cut the surface almost uh, you add the defect to the previous defect and you make a oblique surface on which you can put a proper bone graft and fix it with two 4 mm cancel screws if the graft is big just use stem as an augment because stem will protect graft till it achieves union this is a patient with bilateral tkr with a severe deformity and this is how he enters opd for suture removal this is another example of very severe defect bone graft with screws of course the since the defect was severe stem ek one of the most extreme cases well this is how we did it with uh, ckk implants and graft with stem fixation and all wedges well metal wedges are the flavor of the day simplicity well availability and of course npa has made a lot of them pretty within the reach of the patient the only thing is you can't fill all the defect size because different companies have limitation uh, zimmer will have not more than 15 mm well merrill may have up to 20 mm smith and if you won't give more than 10 mm diff, uh, uh, bone block hence the advantage is readily available by the time you have cut the tibial zerk just add one more zerk and your graft uh, site is cut as per the need of the metal wedge of course if again the question is that the defect is more please add stem because it adds to the stability of the uh, metal wedges and this is one example see where defect this is the example i was saying on the right side i show i just uh, use only the screws and look at the difference on the right side i cut the bone and i undersize the bone but on the left side since the size of the graft was bigger i have used metal wedge with stem this is another example severe deformity and this is how she came back to opd uh, for suture removal after 2 weeks constrain implant do they have role yes if the defect becomes severe well they are the best option because as the defect goes deeper and deeper and deeper well is the ligament which we are really worried of and sometimes they are very frail and they they, are, they hardly exist you just can't depend on them and they are you used to use constrain implants well thank you for the patient hearing any questions sir did you have any problem when you lateralizing the tibial base place and putting a stem there when i lateralize the tibial place so ah. to reduce this well certain systems you don't have because you have an offset stem 
where you don't have an offset stem, you have to be very careful, you can't really lateralize it. Right? And that's the reason I say that the undersizing of the tibial stem, one has to be very, very, very careful. You just can't undersize too much. It affects the size of the femur also in most of the systems. Yeah, it's a very uh, uh, useful talk. I think most of the primaries what we face are, uh, uh, they don't come straight. They come with all complications and gross deformities. Uh, regarding the uh, choice of, uh, uh, you mentioned about bone graft versus augment. Uh, I have seen the screw post what you have been using. Does it make any difference when we put the screws perpendicular to the bone, I mean parallel to the perpendicular as well as the oblique ones what we see? Because logically uh, the loading forces are more acceptable than oblique forces. Uh, if the cut surface is little more or is more, instead of vertical little oblique, they have a far better chance of union and bone graft does wonders with them. But once they are vertically cut, then it becomes a real issue how good the quality of bone is, how sclerotic it is, your alignment, what is the, uh, the size of the defect, how much is the graft you are using is, and how well you are stabilizing it with stem. Because unless the stem becomes the load bearing implant for the first six months, this graft is very likely to fail, I have seen many of them. Right? Hence, so I am very, very careful in these, so there I prefer to use uh, wedges. But a lot of people are using grafts. They have very good uh, outcome. It is not that key graft has a very poor outcome. But in my view, the, what I have seen in my surroundings with my peers and others, and some on my own hands, I try to avoid in these situations bone graft alone. But if there is nothing else, what else can you do? People do come out with bone graft and then use a protected weight bearing. But I am not of the habit of doing protected weight bearing. I am a very aggressive weight bearer immediately after that. Hence, to that need, I have chosen this. But if you have used a bone graft, you have not used a stem which is really <coughs> very well fitting into the stem, well, let the patient do partial weight bearing till the time three months are over or six months till the time the graft shows some signs. Then I'll modify my technique to that. Yeah. And uh, one more thing is uh, when you have a, de a bigger defect, uh, you try to resect, uh, your poly size may increase. I think that the gap balancing is a big challenge. Yeah. And how do you take care of the joint line in such scenarios? Uh, see that the whatever the dissection at depth are my all slides which are 13, 14, 15 years old. I think the last which one I showed was 2009. Uh, I have not used the section at depth since then. Hence, uh, I always, my normal cutting tibia is 5 or 6 millimeters. The more the defect, less the tibia. Whenever I was using Smith & Nephew system, I have never cut. I have just cut 7 mm. Now I am using Merrill, I normally cut tibia at 5 mm. It still cuts 6, 7 mm and then I build up the defect on that. Hence, I am not a good cutter at 10 mm for a very long time, number one. So, uh, resection at depth is absolutely no no for me. If my associate has done it, then it's a problem for me to rebuild it. Number two, if the defect is large and uh, somebody has done it and has used poly, I at least use constrained poly to protect along with stem and others immediately. Any questions from the house? Thank you, Dr. Mittal. So, so I think uh, conserving the bone is still the golden rule. Whether it's a primary or revision, you would like to retain back most of the bone stock and uh, depend less on the augments and uh, uh, bone graft. May I call upon the next speaker, uh, Dr. Deepak, how I do a difficult knee.
good evening all so uh, my talk is on how i do a difficult knee here i am going to touch briefly upon three scenarios first one is failed distal femur internal fixation in elderly extensor mechanism reconstruction and proximal tibial stress fractures coming to first scenario distal femur fractures in elderly uh, this is a very common uh, fracture it accounts to 0.5% of all fractures low energy trauma results in these fractures in the elderly these fractures in elderly have significant fracture comminution there may be associated osteoporosis there can be pre existing knee arthritis and over these there are associated comorbid medical conditions which will delay the functional recovery so we had a 65 year old male teacher who presented to us two years post internal fixation for the distal femur fracture patellectomy was done now he presented with difficulty in bearing weight pain and stiffness his activities of daily living are severely restricted he is a diabetic hypertensive on examination he had a healthy scar range of motion was 0 to 50 degrees blood markers were normal so the x-ray we can see there is varus collapse of the fracture site the implant is backing out there is posterior displacement of the condylar segment patellectomy is done so this is a complex scenario in a osteoporotic elderly patient so what are the management options there are three options revision osteosynthesis arthrodesis or arthroplasty the points to be considered are the physiological age of the patient the available bone quality pre injury functional status and the expectations of the patients so in this scenario our concerns will be the distorted anatomy poor bone stock previous scars and soft tissue additions which will make our dis dissection difficult the exposure because of the post patellectomy status we have to be careful and there is always a risk of infection so after discussing with the patient arthroplasty was decided we went through a midline parapetalar approach distal femur osteotomy was done just after removing the proximal most screw soft tissues were dissected the plate was not removed immediately the plate was we made use of the plate as a bone holder uh, to move the distal uh, condylar segment all the soft tissues were released and the plate was removed along with the bone tissues were sent for culture then we have used a rotating hinge modular segmental endoprosthesis rotational alignment and limb length were maintained post operatively the patient was allowed immediate uh, weight bearing and gradually the patient had a range of motion up to 90 degrees so what does the literature say in this paper in 2006 18 there is a paper from uh, collateroglio where they have studied the distal femur replacement as a revision and they mentioned that the results are as good as a re replacement in the primary setting and the more research was suggested to decide whether primary replacement in the primary setting can be done or it has to be waited for a failure in the latest paper from old journal of orthopedics they have studied a few cases of uh, distal femur replacement in primary setting and they said it is a valid surgical choice so this is a very good option in a selected group of patients and we need more research for formulation of guidelines as in the primary setting for appropriate patient selection so that the patients may be mobilized early. Coming to the scenario 2, extensor mechanism reconstruction, we had a 28 year old male who had gradually increasing left knee swelling since 4 months, pain is progressive in nature. He had a past history of surgery over the left knee, uh, left tibia, three years back where curettage was done and biopsy showed giant cell tumor. So the x-ray shows an expansile lytic lesion, expansile lytic lesion of the proximal tibia with breach of the anterior tibial cortex. This is a recurrent lesion, Campanasi grade 3. 
So these are the MR pictures. We can see the lesion ex breaching the anterior cortex. In this situation, there is no role for extended curettage and segmental resection was planned. So as this is very close, the tibial tuberosity was involved and the patellar tendon was very close, three-fourths of the patellar tendon had to be excised for adequate safe margin. So these are the intra-op pictures where the dissection was done and the proximal tibia along with the femur, uh, fibula were removed with uh, maintaining a safe margin. So here we can see just a stump of the patellar tendon is left and femoral preparation is done and the tibial process was in place. So to maintain the extensor mechanism continuity, we have taken a proline mesh rolled onto itself, attached the prox uh, patellar tendon to it, passed the mesh through the tibial component and then folded the proline mesh onto itself and resutured it there over the patellar tendon with non-absorbable ethy bond. So then we have placed bone graft at the, we have placed some bone graft at the anchoring place and then we have used another mesh to cover the uh, tibial process. The entire construct is covered by the medial gastrocutaneous flap, gastrosoleus flap. These are the post-op x-rays. So this patient had a previous trauma on the opposite side femur. On the same side tibia also, he had a conservatively treated tibial fracture. So the properties of proline mesh, it has exceptional tensile strength and decreased foreign body response. The propensity of the mesh is to stimulate fibroblastic proliferation and form dense adhesions. This feature has made it to go, go into disrepute from the surgeons because it will cause a lot of scarring, but this is the positive point for being used here. Excellent functional outcome with this Marlex mesh reconstruction. There is a systematic review where synthetic mesh was compared with allograft for extensor mechanism reconstruction the failure rate was almost equal in both the groups and because of the easier availability and low cost, they said the extensor, uh, the synthetic mesh will perform well better than the allograft extensor mechanism. So this is another paper where they have studied the mesh technology for tumor process reconstruction. So. The scenario three is uh, tibial stress fractures. The stress fractures are fractures which happen due to repeated microtrauma. Fatigue fractures are because of abnormal loads on normal bones. Insufficiency fractures are normal stress on abnormal underlying bones. So this, there is a classification by Dr. Arun Mulaji, which they have mentioned the stress fractures being intra-articular and extra-articular. Intra-articular are malunited and ununited. Extra-articular, impending, acute, united with less than 5 degree angulation, malunited, and ununited. Osteoarthritis of, arthritis of knees with associated coronal deformities like varus and valgus, this results in asymmetric loading and abnormal repeated stresses concentration in the proximal tibial metaphases, resulting in the insufficiency stress fractures. This is compounded by the usually associated osteoporosis Historically, stress fractures have been treated conservatively or in a staged manner, like plating or any internal fixation for the stress fracture, let the stress fracture heal and then deal with the osteoarthritis. With the advent of the stem extenders, the surgery has become a single staged one. So I will show three cases. So this is a 65-year-old female presenting with a stress fracture in the tibia. So this is undisplaced stress fracture. So we have used a long tibial extender, stem extender. This is another short female, 55 years, with an extra-articular deformity. But as the extra-articular deformity is less than 20 degrees, we have not done any osteotomy for the fracture site. And this was amenable for the intra-articular correction. So we did uh, use a stem and have the patient had a small defect medially, so we used screws. The last case 
In this, this is a 65-year-old patient with a frank non-union of the proximal metaphysis fracture. So we had to open the fracture site, take down the fibrous tissue, decorticate the fracture ends, and we had to use a unicortical plate for better rotational stability. So uh, a word of caution, when we are using a plate here, there is increased chance of wound dehiscence, and we may have to go for a repeat surgery for the plate removal. So this is the paper by Dr. Arun Mulaji, where they have classified the fractures and treatment guidelines. This is paper by Moskal, where they have used plate and stems. And this is paper from Ganga Hospital, where they say early detection is necessary to prevent recalcitrant stress fracture and non-union. So TKIA with long stems addresses both the problems of osteoarthritis and stress fractures by correcting the arthritis, restoring the limb alignment, and bypassing the fracture site, which aids in union, the stem, by bypassing the fracture site, acts as an internal splint and stabilizes the fracture. Thank you. So really challenging cases, beautifully done. Uh, I think they will have a good uh, long-term follow-up. Any questions from the audience? Sir, that was a cemented uh, stem, sir. That was a cemented stem. Right. So, what is the length of the stem? Because the first case that you saw, uh, showed, was the stem was... Hello. Uh, I think we need to take a quick break uh, because uh, we have a surgery, live surgery. Uh, there are a lot of questions we need to ask, uh, which we will keep it for the later. Uh, there's a live surgery which we was scheduled okay. tomorrow. Okay. We will have to prepone it today. Uh, this is Dr. Krishna Kiran, and he is ready with the surgery for latitude uh, poroscoted stem. May I request uh, Dr. Makwana and Dr. Satinder Garg to be on the uh, uh, moderate the surgery? Yes. As well as uh, you, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Samsung and Dr. Bab uh, Murukun Babu. <laughs> Continue with the talks uh, after this. Yeah, we are live, uh, Dr. Krishna. If you can just uh, brief us the case before you take your incision. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. We can also see you. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. Uh, the I was told that it's around four o'clock. Uh, tomorrow is some Amavasya day, so we had four hips scheduled, but all of them refused surgery tomorrow. So we had to barge in on the knee meeting, so I'm extremely sorry for that. So this is a 58-year-old man with uh, right hip pain for the last three, four years, and uh, last six months he's been unable to walk. And uh, you can see that uh, there is a avascular necrosis of the right femoral head and collapse of the femoral head. So uh, this is a straightforward case of AVN. And uh, uh, we're planning a posterior approach. So this is the foot end of the patient. This is the head end of the patient. This is anterior and this is posterior for orientation. And we have two views for you. Uh, can you keep the, keep the PNP? Don't remove that. Yeah. So that uh, you can see uh, everything clearly. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Yeah, so the uh, first step is to make sure that the patient has got no, uh, you know, adduction of the pelvis. So we have to make sure that the, uh, so this is an app, mobile based app called Angle Meter Pro Plus. Can you just uh, switch off the light? Yeah, so you can see that the patient is around five degrees flexed. So that will be the correction for the surgery. So we always use this app to make sure that uh, the intraoperative measurements are uh, correct. So you don't need any navigation or robotics for hip replacement. You just need proper measurements using simple apps. So I'll show you how we use them to get our hips right all the time. Okay. So the incision is pretty straightforward. 
using a, a slightly larger incision for the sake of demonstration please feel free to stop me wherever you feel you need to so it's a curvilinear incision centered around the greater trochanter posterior third extending onto the femur half of it is below the trochanter and half is above and i like to use uh, pre mode electrocautery dissection so that the blood loss is lesser and we haven't had any problems with wound healing because of the same technique so dissect till you identify the fascia lata and then you take a second to delineate the fascia lata so that that helps us in closing the wound at a later date is it possible for you to show the head uh, camera from the yeah. top uh top thoda upar se dikhao like yeah yeah so that that pip which is there is a smaller picture should look as a bigger picture yeah thank you enough? thank you yeah 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 right so but the orientation may be changing a little bit yeah this is the head end of the patient and this is the foot end of the patient okay, okay. right So I just make a small, uh, you know, subcutaneous plane so that I'll, I'm able to close it back uh, easily. You know, I palpate the GT, and you have to always go from inferior to superior. So you cut the fascia inferiorly till you see the vastus lateralis ridge there, and then you you can you know extend the thing up. So this is the vastus lateralis you can see, right? Can you see the vastus lateralis? Right. Yeah. So then I will uh, make a facial incision into the G max, and we'll split the muscle in the line of its fibers. That's it. So you split the muscle in the line of its fibers, and we use a Chanley retractor for. Uh, yeah. So you can abduct the hip when you are inserting the the anterior limb of the chanli. Then you complete the dissection of the G max right till the skin incision, so that it's fine. The assistant now extends and internally rotates the hip to keep the sciatic nerve away from the wound. And now you identify the tendon of the gluteus maximus. We do a partial release of the tendon in most of our cases. to help anterior translation of the femur so that is the gmax tendon which i am releasing here you can see that can you see that not sure yes we can see and there are a lot of perforators which cross through so yeah, do you find a perforator will be at the lower border of the gmax tendon so you don't cut right. that you just recess the upper third and then we will see as we go along whether we need to do more at this stage i will use a limb length stitch the scale so this is the uh, collinear axis of the limb and the limb length stitch will work only in this axis so the leg is asked to uh, leg is allowed to position is uh, placed in a position of rest which is around 20 degrees of flexion and then we mark out the collinear axis of the femur and then i will take a stitch in the pelvis we take two bites in the collinear axis of the femur and then the bite comes on itself so that it is stable there and it will give us an assessment of the composite length and combined offset so these uh, things can be assessed using the limb length stitch i will show you as we go along how we use this so this is one of the uh, uh, the parameters which we use so now i'm using the this instrument uh, which will give us the collinearity of the limb so it, and i will So, how much is the shortening in this case? It is around five millimeter shortening. So, we are not aiming to lengthen this leg or anything. So, I want to restore whatever is the original one. Okay. Yes. So, we don't want to over lengthen the leg. That is the big, big challenge. Okay. And we will have uh, multiple checks and balances as we go along. So, this is the 
don't change the camera, man. Yeah, so this is the mark, okay? And this remains constant. So nobody touches that uh, stitch. Now the next step is to identify the posterior border of the abductor. So uh, the tip of the trochanter is the guide to the posterior border of the abductor. Why is it going off on again and again? Yeah. Are you getting the telecast? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, please let me know because my screen, I'm losing the telecast on and off. Yeah, we'll let you know. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'm doing, uh, I'm dissecting the trochanteric bursa and I will identify the posterior border of the gluteus medius. You can see here. Right. Because this posterior border never extends beyond the tip of the trochanter. So, and this is a, a important landmark. And once you identify the posterior border, you position a... Uh, Homans. Homan retractor underneath the anterior border. And now you can see the gluteus minimus and piriformis and the sentinel vessel. You can see nicely here. So this is a sentinel vessel, which is the upper border of the piriformis. And the, you make a plane between the G minimus and the piriformis. And now reposition the spike underneath the gluteus minimus to identify the anterior capsule and the rectus femoris reflected it. So you can see there nicely. That is the anterior capsule. And this is the reflected head of the rectus femoris. Okay? Once you do that, Next step is to identify the insertion of the piriformis. The piriformis inserts more anteriorly than you think into the anterior half of the uh, trochanteric area. It doesn't insert into the piriformis fossa. And this must be respected when we cut it. The first incision is along the top of the piriformis, including the capsule. Mm. And it goes right up till the insertion onto the anterior part of the trochanter. And now you will go close to the posterior border of the greater trochanter and take off the short external rotators. This is a quadratus here, close to the bone. And then we will repair it back with transosseous sutures at the end of the surgery. As far as you, uh, you, as long as you stay close to the posterior border of the trochanter and posterior border of the abductor muscle, it is unlikely that you will injure the sciatic nerve sciatic. because the sciatic nerve is midway between the GT and the ischium, lying on the quadratus muscle. So, the key step is to always respect the interval, whether it's a revision, whether it's a primary, whether it's a complex. You Once you make this incision into the, don't dislocate the hip, into the uh, posterior border of abductor and the posterior border of the GT, you don't violate the edge of that flap. Once you make that flap, you make all your dissection inside the flap. You don't go outside the flap. You can see that. Right. Um, yeah. Yes. So, so this is the this is the uh, capsule. Yeah. And as long as you remain inside this, nothing will happen. If you come outside and wander off outside the thing, then you'll injure the nerve. Okay. So now the ex assistant will extend the hip. So you can see the posterior inferior part of the capsule there. Please feel free to stop me wherever you want, okay? Sure. Yeah. So I am giving a posterior inferior release incision into the capsule so that all my posterior tissues can be retracted back. And what is the limit of this release incision? It is the operator externus muscle. You can see the operator externus muscle there. Okay? Yeah. Hey, what do you think of it? Yes, I'm so sorry. I, I'm losing the telecast on and off. So this is a glute, uh, the operator externus muscle. Can you see that? Yeah, we are able to see it. Yeah. I'm, Your yeah. hand is slightly in between, right? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. this is That's the pin okay. which is going between the capsule here and the ischium. So this is the posterior wall of the acetabulum. Labrum. And this is the ischium. So I'm putting a pin into the ischium. ischium. Okay. So the sciatic now and the posterior dislocation are the only two deterrents to the posterior approach. Otherwise, posterior approach is an extensile approach. You can approach the full femur through the posterior approach. 
Yes, that's right. So uh, the next step is to release the anterior capsule and the reflected head of rectus femoris, which I'm doing here under vision. I'm cutting the anterior capsule and the reflected head of the rectus femoris. Is that clear there? Yes, very clear. Yeah, yeah now we will do an infracotyloid pin uh, positioning and see uh, as a second check for our leg length, you know, in addition to the limb length stitch, we will position the infracotyloid pin at the level of the transverse acetabular ligament. Pin you, Charlie, pin you. One more Charlie pin, please. So this is the position of the transverse acetabular ligament. We externally rotate the hip and mark out the position there. So that is the second check for your leg length. So this we will reposition at the end of the surgery. Okay? Right. Now we are ready to dislocate the hip. The assistant gently flexes, adducts, and internally rotates the hip. And now we are able to get the hip out. So I have to expose the lesser trochanter. That's the lesser trochanter exposed now. And typically between the lesser trochanter and the neck will be the anterior capsule. So this was is the glistening structure. See that? You can see that. Especially if it's in there. So I am positioning the uh, thing between the psoas and the anterior capsule and I will cut the anterior capsule under vision. And once the anterior capsule is cut, your ability to internally rotate the hip will increase. Okay? So that's the mobility. So at this stage, I will stop. Now we go with the uh, second, uh, uh, third thing which we do for leg length. We mark the fixed position on the lesser trochanter and the GT. And then we make measurements to the center of the femoral head. The center of the femoral head is the center of a sphere. It will be somewhere there. So this is around roughly around 60. And the horizontal offset from the fixed point is around 50. Now we have the neck length. Mood on Mood. 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 So we keep all options available for us and uh, fortunately Merrill provides all options. So this is the 135 degrees neck shaft angle and uh, this is where the neck cut for the neck shaft angle will be. So since this is a male patient, this will be ideal for this patient, the uh, 135 neck shaft angle. We also have the uh, 132 and 128 where the neck cut will be more proximal. So this is for the Proximally coated implant, okay? Are you able to get? Since these trunnions are the ones which are the exposed parts of the implant, this must be used as a guide to make the neck cut. We cannot have any arbitrary guide which is based on the part which goes into the femur. So if I put my cut here and I use this same stem, then if I put a zero uh, head in on that, then I will not change the leg length on the femoral side. Is that clear? Right. Yes. Yeah, so you can use the trunnion. So Is that the so osteophyte above the human? Sorry, that's an osteophyte on the neck. Yeah, that is yeah. right. So this is an osteophyte. And also the so neck also you has a lot. some... <laughs> yeah. Neck also has some osteophyte there. You can see the shape of the head is lost, misshapen. Was this only AVN or it was an uh, osteoarthritis? Because osteoarthritis is one on two stage four AVN now. Right. Okay. Thirty two. Unda mana dega dega. One twenty eight. Unda. Yeah. So I'm remarking the uh, uh, neck cut here, and then I'll make my neck cut. The leg is held at ninety degrees. Can somebody zoom out the leg position? Full leg jupe chando kadanlo. Yeah, the leg is held at 90 degrees when I'm making the neck cut. So that the uh, cut is not skewed in one direction or another.
Hoşçakalın. Yeah. So now we are able to remove the head. Little bit of capsule is attached anteriorly. So I will cut that and I will remove it. The next step we do is measure the head size. Okay, so somebody focus on that. 49. Yeah, so the head size is roughly around 49. Can you show that? Show them this. Did you pitch So I've used these uh, traditional uh, AMP rings to measure. And typically the socket size will be between 3 and 5 millimeter larger than the Head diameter. Straight wall or either na ek video. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. So you would start reaming right from 49 onwards, or you would start reaming from smaller point onwards. So we will initially medialize the socket and go closer to 49 than you know going all the way from beginning to the end. Correct. Yeah, now the leg is in a position of 45 degrees of flexion and 45 degrees of internal rotation. And the assistant is using a bone hook to anteriorly translate the femur forward. You can see that? Yeah. Now I can see the uh, remaining redundant anterior capsule, which I will cut under vision. So this is a centimeter or so strip of anterior capsule, which we will cut to make sure that it is easy to expose the Acetabulum. This is a broken uh, uh, headpiece. Now, at this stage, you palpate the anterior superior iliac spine spike. And then reposition the anterior spike in the direction of the ASIS. And if you remember, the line from ASIS to ischium divides the acetabulum into four quadrants. Correct. So, this goes into the anterior column. Mm. And now the assistant will take the hip into flexion and externally rotate the hip. So it takes everything out of the way. Out of the way. Yeah. Uh, focus Just give me a second, I'll give you a better focus. socket gun Yeah, yeah. Right, this is the final angle of it. Yeah, now you can see the, have a 360 degree view of the establum. Because you have anteriorly translated the femur, the anterior capsule gets tight. So anterior inferiorly, I will give another release incision just like posterior inferiorly we gave. Again till the level of the quadratus and now the capsule will fall out of the way using the inferior retractor. Can you see that? Yes. Do you put any of the pins in the... Uh, Just one pin in the posterior... Su Supraestabular region? No, no pin in the supraestabular region. Okay. But I will show you the... Uh, can you... Can somebody guide them as to what... So there is a hypertrophic... Uh, capsule. Labrum. Yeah, capsule is also a bit hypertrophic, which I am excising. Mm -hmm. So that we have all the four walls visible for us. Establum focus here. Amundu ninchi. Focus of no. And this is the pulvinar which I am excising, and you can see the nicely see the transverse establer ligament. I will show you in a moment. Sure. Idi focus here. Ni net na ketla gan padtu no miratla jaya. Can you see it? So the as long as we remain within the confines of the acetabulum anterior and posterior walls, we will not injure the femoral 
neurovascular and the as the sciatic nerve respectively pinned at this stage we can use a supraestabular pin for the audience sake so that you can see the acetabulum properly and if you are planning to put the screw it will help you to guide the screw putting it in the column yeah so now you can see a 360 degree exposure of the acetabulum can you guys see that I think it looks pretty decent whatever i am able to see yeah full 360 degree exposure of the acetabulum so unless you get this sort of an exposure in all the patients we should not start start reaming or anything because then there is a tendency to make a mistake with the cup and uh, that will not be very forgiving okay so now we are uh, ready to go and this is a transverse acetabular ligament you can see it nicely here yes yeah and yeah. Uh, this is the this is the horseshoe shape floor of the acetabulum so all of you can i'm sure appreciate just in a moment yeah fovea yeah so there's a operator vessel there which is bleeding yeah Oh. right so this horseshoe is an indicator of the uh, the uh, medial position of the tear drop where we want to position the socket so the first reamer goes inferiorly just a second the first reamer goes inferiorly to position it flush with the tear drop so once i am sure that that horseshoe shape is gone now i will go in the definitive direction 49 this 47 49 okay and we already measured the head size to be 49 and uh, the cup we want it to be around 52 or 54 54 and in this case so this is the direction of the transverse acetabular ligament i am positioning the reamer parallel to the tal inner margin of the tal and i am reaming the acetabulum it is usually anteriorly inside and inferiorly inside to get a antiversion yeah that is right so we will measure what antiversion we are giving just in a moment so just a moment i will show you how we measure the thing these reamers are a bit blunt Nice. That would bleed. The moment he reams again, it would bleed again. The blood pressure should be down. So to have a good field in the hip, it is very necessary to have a good anesthetist who can who can keep the blood pressure as low as possible. <laughs> to the cameraman can you zoom out a little yeah thank you Reamers are uh, not great. We uh, are struggling with that. Doctor Krishna, can you show us in which direction you have to ascertain while reaming? The audience would like to know about it so that you know they uh, by the outside landmarks, whether it is to the corner of the room or 45 degree to the table or the ground. So light off chain. So we use this as a landmark. So there is no corner of the room or anything. Correct. So this is a measured thing. It's around forty degrees. So this app is available everywhere on the mobile. It's available free of cost. Right. Yeah. So you can just uh, cling wrap your mobile and use it. So 
this is around 40 degrees so it's accurate to plus or minus 2 degrees so and what this, what app is it it's called angle meter pro plus okay and the native establishment I mean, just flip it over is around 14 to 15 degrees of antiversion all right got it yeah yeah so we will always uh, do the reaming parallel to the uh, tal inner margin of the tal correct and cross verify the value so mm. tal is a very good guide for antiversion yes but it's not that good a guide for inclination as per beverland mm. who described the technique itself so this is beverland's technique it's not my own technique so he uses a, a digital inclinometer mm. i find that little bit cumbersome i tried but it is too big an instrument so this is much much simpler and we always use all these tools in our surgery to make sure that the x-rays are you know uniform boring there is no surprise for us correct and it's it's a calibrated surgery for the patient also mm. so you don't need any so we've done a lot of navigated hips this is the information that it gives the inclination and version <laughs> of the cup so you don't need expensive equipment entity so what what reamer is that you are using right now this is around 55 so you have gone about 54 yeah but the merrill cup will be 54 will be with 55 reamer but i am not happy with the reaming yet mm. you are unable to go deeper because the reamers are not there right idhar diya tu kitne diye it's not reaming out anteriorly i guess no 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 it's still we have still not got the ap capture okay so i'll just do it once and i'm satisfied with the depth of reaming and i'll be able to tell you uh, in a reasonable way you can see the reamer is not working drill very much good by it you are using a striker striker uh, we are using a striker but the reamers are unusually blunt Normally because the striker would have a separate reamer attachment which would have more torque and less rotation uh, less revolutions the we are using the same one yeah yeah maybe the local reps wanted to simulate a real life situation mm. so they don't want to give good reamers okay <laughs> so, but uh, there is no choice for us we have to wait till we get good bleeding bone right so this is not an ideal thing to do for acetabulum uncemented keep on reaming like this but there is no you know i am unable to go deeper so the cup will become exteriorized and then it will all go wrong so you can use small reamer to just get in slightly deep yeah the small reamer is also not working What the smallest it? one would be the sharpest because that would not be used much yeah Yeah, now it's getting some bone out. So now the key key thing which comes is you know how do we know that we have reached the uh, correct right the size of the establishment depth we have discussed that the horseshoe must disappear mm. and the cup must be parallel to the inner margin of the tail how do we know the with the uh, size of the socket so if you notice the establishment was uh, Uh, the femoral head was quite damaged 
Mm. Head to head. So it could be, you know, it's maybe larger than 49. Yeah. That's what I'm tending to think because I don't get AP capture even though 65. So we may have to put a, a larger cup than that. So the head is badly damaged. So the, uh, now I will depend on when I get the AP capture. So you can see here now, my reamer is tending to catch the anteroposterior column. Okay. So this is the first point of, you know, stopping. Where now I have two point fixation, but two point fixation is not good enough for uh, uh, uncemented. We need a third point of fixation. That yes. is a three point fixation that will give us stability in a plane perpendicular to the anterior superior to posterior inferior plane. That is called as the superior inferior fit. Right. And if you can, you know, uh, get it by upsizing the cup. So fifty six reamer I will try. I'll do a 56 trial because I'm now coming close to where I need to be. Right. 56 trial copy. So you try with 56 with Merrill. Typically, I notice that the uh, real cup is slightly larger. So we may have to use a 57 reamer. Yeah. The mouth reaming should be done with 57. Yeah. Right. So now this cup has got some AP capture, but still it is rotating. You can see. Mm. So that is not good news. So we will have to upsize till it stops rotating and it should not have any toggle. This is because of poor reamer. So you might have to go slightly more deeper along with the... Yeah, I will go slightly deeper. With the a same smaller side. reamer and then mouth remit with 57. 47. Next to 51. Hmm. So it's So this is quite a tall man, he's six foot two, three. So it's okay if we don't get the... I think he would uh, have a good bone stock medially also, so you can go, go slightly more deeper. Yeah. So now I'm getting closer to the... You can see that. Yeah. See? Now I'm getting closer to where I want to be. And we'll reposition the ischial pipe. So now I'm coming closer to the posterior column. Slightly more inferior. Only put fifty six copy. We will recheck with the fifty six trial. Now we have definitely have the AP capture. Mm. You can see I'm rotating the cup and it's not moving, but the superior inferior toggle is not great. So at this stage, you can have two options. One, you use the same cup, you fix it with a couple of screws to get stability, or you go one size up. So I think we will go one size up in this case, but I personally think the columns are reasonably intact. The walls Correct. are intact. So I will go one size up. That will typically give a, the uh, superior inferior stability as well. I think he should be reaming deep with the huh? Yeah. Sure. Tally. And he should be reaming deeper deeper slightly deeper. more deeper with the 56 because the cup is shallow and the mouth is wide. So this is a 58 reamer and this looks pretty good yeah. with respect to how you know we want it to be. You should. 58, 58 trial distance. 
So there are certain situations where the mouth is wide because the head of the femur is deformed and the acebulum is shallow. So in such cases, you need to go slightly more deeper. That is right. But since the reamers are not great, I am unable to do that. In the reamer room. So now we have gone as medial as we can because now we are on the medial wall. Correct. And we can't go any further medially. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to oversize the cup. I will accept this and then bail out. 57. So this is 57 broach, uh, reamer? Yeah, this is a 57 reamer. This looks reasonable. I'm getting some AP capture. Right. So I will put a 58 cup. Okay? Yeah. 58 reamer. Yeah. This is okay. I think it's not perfect, but it's okay. 58 cup. So the 58 cup has got definite AP capture, but the superior infrared toggle is still not great. No, it's good. Yeah, but I will accept it and go for uh, screw fixation in this case because we can't oversize yes. it anymore. Yes. So now it will blow out the whole uh, columns. 58 cup. So this is the uh, socket. Can can you zoom this one? Yeah. Okay. 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 Here, uh, the patient specifically asked for a dual mobility cup, so we are using it because it's 58. Okay. So this is a good hemispherical porous coated socket. <coughs> the and sector is 180. It is a 180, yeah. And we will use the screws again in the direction of the... Right, once, once it bottoms out, now we are okay. The AP capture and superior infrared toggle both are there. You can see that. Okay. Right. I am rotating the cup, it's not moving. And mm. when I'm moving it perpendicular to the direction, the entire pelvis is rocking. You can see that? Correct. Yeah? That's yeah. it. So this looks pretty good. Now we will confirm the position of our cup. And we can see that it's around uh, 37 degrees of inclination. Mm. And the antiversion is roughly around 15 degrees. That's perfect. Yeah? So this is okay. But since this is a dual mobility cup, we always put screws for this. Hmm. Uh, because the torque on the dual mobility cup will be larger because we are using a nearly 50-52 head. The, uh, so the cups tend to pull out. So yeah, must, so there is an umbrella effect. Yeah, so we must secure them with at least one or two screws. So as I told you, the uh, direction of the, the, uh, the spike is again crucial because your, the, the pelvis is, acetabulum is divided into quadrants. Mm. 
by the line connecting the ASIS to the ischium. So, so because of the uh, position of the patient, that is true. Right. It appears as if this is the 12 o'clock position. Mm. Actually, the 12 o'clock is underneath that spike. So your anterior superior is this one and posterior superior is this one. Correct. I see the younger uh, surgeon is trying to put the screws here. You will not get any screw here. So this is a dome which you see on the x-ray. And right. that is where the screw must go. So the anterior spike which is dividing the segment into four quadrants will again be a guide for us to position the screw as well. Yeah, screw in the correct 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock position. position. So you don't need to measure it. It will be 30, 35, 40, 45. Still, it will be okay. Right. Because it goes right into the dome of the establo. So I have not measured it. I know it will be 30, 35 because of the... Uh, number of times we have used the same technique. Mm. And it is pretty good, good, good hold. And we'll put one more screw because it's a good idea to put two screws, not one screw. Ah, now it's filling. Yeah, the 25 screws. Mm -hmm. It could put either a second to a third figure. Well, put a whole other other. It's for a ton of camera. Your present for Zoom out. Zoom out. Huh. He's unable to, you know, show the way we are seeing it. Just go back to the previous. But still, it's okay. You can see the I direction think of the screw. So it's important to position the screws flush here because the uh, we will put a uh, mod this is a modular uh, implant. Right. Can you open the modular liner? Modular dual mobility. So it will have a metal interface between the cup and the thing. It's not a non-modular thing. Mm. So if you eccentrically fit it, it will come out. We must not use it in patients who are less than 50 years old unless there is a uh, compelling reason. So this is the, you know, this is the modular thing. What, so a, what diameter uh, shell is this? This is the uh, diameter which is corresponding to the 58. The inner diameter will be roughly around 54 for this because this is around 4 millimeters right. thick. So the plastic yeah. shell would be 54. That's right. So you can see here, uh, I'm just positioning it in a correct way. And then make sure that it is treated well, because this is going to be the weak link for this articulation. OK? So now we're done with the establum. Now we'll come to the femur. So we use the hip instrumentation system, which is very Intuitive designed by Dr. Vijay Bose, called as a Bose concept hip. So people who are embarking on hip replacement surgery, it's a good uh, investment. Yeah. So just now, the assistant will now again hold the femur in 90 degrees, and then I'm positioning a... So now check the size again. No, or not required. Once you do the femur, you'll be checking it. 
yeah yeah we'll check everything we'll check the combined version we'll check the femoral uh, uh, this thing so right this is okay it will yeah come for you so now you have to expose the you know lateral most corner of the uh, femur so that your entry is there will not excise any soft tissue there we'll just dissect them out yeah. if you notice we've already uh retained as much of piriformis as we could and now i will right. open the canal posterolaterally you know mm. is, yeah can you see that can yeah see? yeah not that one this one yeah now you can see that yeah yeah so we are going posterolaterally and just remove a little bit of segment of bone then we'll find the canal it's not that much of a difference whether it goes in varus valgus so it's a good thing to position the stem centrally hmm we tend to you know open the canal need a start up this start up this plant to go adu vetsu canal adu kaadu adu vetsu there is some sclerosis there so we are Yeah. Now we are able to go in. Now we drop right into the canal. So it's a pretty narrow canal. If you notice the free of X-ray, it's not a good idea to use a fully hexagonal furrow type stem in these cases. Because right. Because the you know it can have a distal catch, and there is an issue. And this is a big man, so we should not have acetabular femoral mismatch. By that I mean that if you put a size. So what eight, size reamer was that? This is size ten. This is the minimum reamer which we must go through. So we are here using a uh, you know proximally coated implant. Right. Which is different to the uh, thing. So we must tailor the implant to the patient. So you prefer putting proximally coated implant in all your patients, or just th because this patient is slightly with a good bone stock, a male, so you prefer doing that. uh typically we would use a hc coated implant in most of our cases this is hc coated however okay. uh whenever there is narrow canal mm. and significant acetabular femoral mismatch correct you know the uh, acetabular size is large but we are unable to position the properly sized femoral stem that is when we would use a proximally coated implant okay and in female patients we don't use the uh, hc coated implant as well because they they do not have adequate you know neck length options mm. so the neck length becomes too large for the uh, for the female patient so you over lengthen the leg and increase the offset so this is ideal for female patients then you see you should be able to introduce the stem without much effort the, except for the yeah, proximal without any effort and it's the last 1 cm i am malleting we start from 4 4 and now we check what is the version of the femur so i'm taking the leg position make sure that it is 90 we focus it yeah it's 90 and now i know that we so this is roughly around 15 degrees of antiversion femoral antiversion okay so we are shooting for a combined antiversion of 30 degrees is so when clear? when you start broaching how much amount of bone you you broach up to the cortical bone or you allow some cancellous bone to remain there so these are fit stems they are not filled stems 
So the first system which will give us the good fit, even if it retains cancel as bone all around, is the one which we will use. We will not try and fill that. So what we will do is we will check for rotational stability, right. axial stability, and absence of interface mobility. Correct. The three things we will check, and we will try and make the stem parallel to the posterior neck plane. So this is the posterior neck plane, right. and I will try and position the stem parallel to the posterior neck plane. So as long as I am able to introduce the stem like this, where mm -hmm. only a centimeter or so I have to hammer, I will keep upside it. But if I am having to, you know, introduce the whole stem like this, mm -hmm. then I won't do go for it. Okay. Right. So your uh... you can see the sound there also. So you go with the native version of the femur. We are going with the native version of the femur as long as it is not abnormal. If it is abnormal, then you have to change your strategy. Correct. Because you cannot use a non-modular stem where the femoral version is abnormal. Because with uncemented stem, you can make 5-10 degrees of change, but you cannot change much. Correct. So you will then choose a either a modular option or a cone Wagner type of device or a cemented stem. Or cemented stem. Correct. Where you have versional freedom. One other situation where you will re require it is a high riding hip, where there is a trochanteric uh, upriding. In those situations, again, you will have to use implants which have got craniocaudal freedom as well, where you can position them wherever we want craniocaudal. So you can see here, this is 60, uh, which we actually started off, you know. Yeah, we started off with 60. The horizontal yeah, was 50. Here, roughly around 60. And uh, offset is around 50, 50, which we started off with. So this is probably OK for us. And we'll put a zero head and then do the trial reduction, OK? So now we have 128 and 132 options. We'll see based on what we get with the limb length stitch, OK? Right. So it's nicely reduced. Now you come to the leg length stitch and see. And the leg length stitch is showing that there is no over lengthening. This is exactly where we had marked our leg length stitch. Right. Can you, can you give me the, you can see that, you know, mark. So there is no over lengthening here. Okay. Correct. Got it? Yeah. yeah. And infracordialoid pin there though? So our guys have got a habit of you looking at me as if I'm doing the case for the first time in my life. <laughs> so that always happens in live surgeries, you know. Although we do this every day. So you can see with the infracotyloid pin as well, exactly where the pre tip was pre-op, we have restored it there. Right. Okay. And now what we do, I'll show you something. We will keep on increasing the hip length, you know. To see if we have, we know that we have restored the offset. Plus four at the end. So one other thing is it should be easy to dislocate the hip. You know, it should not be undislocatable. Even the normal hip, you dislocate it at some point. So you should not make undislocatable hips. Those are typically too tight, over lengthened with increased offset. So now I'm using a plus four head just to demonstrate a concept to you how we can use the leg length stitch for, you know, our uh, benefit. You on purpose have kept that brooch out slightly about point. Yeah, about a millimeter or so. That is an indicator that, you know, this is the correct size. Okay. Because if, if I'm able to go flush, then I will use the next size because I'm unable to go flush. Okay. That is because that is why I'm, you know, happy with this. So that's the thing that you look up, look at the fixation in the bone. It should be slightly out. So a millimeter or so out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now we're reducing with a plus four. So it will go in. So you can have a play about a centimeter or so. Now we check what happens to the leg length. Okay. You can see now we have over lengthened the leg. Correct. Increased so by this four millimeters. That zero is the correct offset for this patient. 
and here we have over lengthened as well as you know increase the offset of the hip got it correct so we will go with the zero only we will not go with plus 4 so you start with the smallest minus 4 keep on upsizing till you over lengthen the leg in a case where you don't want to achieve limb length discrepancy wherever you have over lengthening that indicates that you have changed the offset change the length of the limb so that is how you can indirectly use the uh, limb length stitch for a combined offset measurement okay you understand that so right. it is not very accurate with the leg length not perfect but this you know it works most of the times if you are able to restore it to where it is then you are not over lengthening the leg that works and second thing is if you are over lengthening it uh, with a higher head size you are changing the offset here because we are looking at combined parameters you are not looking at femur and acetabulum in isolation we are trying to restore the acetabular plus femoral offset we are trying to restore the acetabular plus femoral length we are restoring the combined antiversion on acetabulum and femur so we are not looking at independent parameters do you do you not check the heel and the knee length that, uh, that with is the very very inaccurate you know that will not at all work. you just try this this works uh, in all cases it's just that you have to sequentially do this the same way and then you will learn how to use that uh, technique so we don't check the heel or anything because that is very very inaccurate and one leg is adapted other adapted so it's not going to be of any value So now we will go with the uh, real implant. Skin is a mobile structure. The question from the audience is: Skin is a mobile structure. So how will it not be stretched when you are uh, measuring the bony length? That is why we have multiple landmarks. I am not using only the limb length stitch. So using you multiple do. landmarks can help yeah. in ascertaining. It's not only yes. the skin. They have so used. So what I have done is I have combined uh, two techniques. We are restoring the acetabulum to the inner margin of the tal whereby we are restoring the acetabular center of rotation is that clear right we have measured the parameters on the femoral side the leg length and the offset and we are restoring that so by default we are restoring the combined length of that particular patient we have measured the version we are restoring the combined version we have measured the offset and we are restoring the offset is that clear right correct so that we are anyhow doing with our measurement because we are skeptical people we don't want to believe one technique but if you use multiple landmarks like we are using the leg length stitch we are using the intracotyloid pin we are using our measurement we are using a transverse acetabular ligament we are looking at ap capture and supra inferior toggle we are positioning our screws in the correct way we are looking at the femoral stem for axial rotational and uh, stability and no interface mobility and that is how you get the hip perfect in each and every case yeah. right so this is size 8 neck shaft angle 128 the native neck shaft angle is around 130 so we are using a 128 neck shaft angle for this patient and we will use a proximally coated implant okay yeah Wherever there is a dot type A canal, you must be careful using the fully hetero coated stems because you will get distal catch before proximal fixation. And these devices are meant to proximally fix, and the distal is only a supplementary fixation. So Correct. whenever you find the acetabular diameter, suppose you have a 52 cup, you must at least have a 11 or 12 stem. If you have a 10 stem or an 8 stem, then there is a challenge for you. So this is a uh, proximally porous coated stem so you can use only this much you don't need all this you know it's like the taper lock uh, microplastic design it is just to transmit the weight in one direction stresses like this is to center the stem and we have used lot of stems like this which were actually meant to be in varus like the meta stem and you know the taper lock microplasty all this they don't it doesn't matter as long as the uh, stem is stable it will ingrow yeah so this is pretty good scratch fit as you will see and i stopped there because that much of the coating was outside with the trial as well 
I'm rotating the thing. It is, you know, perfect. And then I will recheck the. Uh, so the seat is 6.2 and 50. Yeah, this is okay. So it's about two millimeter prouder than the trial. So we will definitely go with zero head. Original, original zero. We will use a ceramic on poly uh, dual mobility articulation because that tends to reduce the wear and the intraprosthetic dislocation, which tends to happen at 10, 12 years after these sort of bearings, is reduced because now you don't have that much wear between the ceramic ball and the polyethylene. Right. So uh, these are only the only bearings which are still available with conventional polyethylene. So you must be wary about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the polyethylene wear as an offshoot. So we do not tend to use it in younger patients. We tend to use it in older patients who want to be more mobile. So this guy is around 58, 60 years old. So we are okay with uh, using a dual mobility. But I wouldn't use it in a 50-year-old or say 48-year-old. There we would go with a conventional... Uh, uh, ceramic on ceramic. Ceramic on crosslink poly or ceramic on ceramic bearing for those things. Dr. Krishna, yeah. uh, the audience wants to know how can you, how do you use the angle meter app if possible? I know that it's taking up your operative time. It's just It is very simple. When you position the patient, make sure that the pelvis is not dropping forward or backward. So there is no adduction or abduction of the pelvis. There is no flexion extension of the pelvis. Correct. So you just position the app. Uh, you open the app, it will show zero angle. That's all. Hmm. So anybody can use it. And then you position it there. And then you measure the position of the patient. Now you're sure that the patient is not in, uh, you know, uh, flexion or extension. Uh, then whenever you're using the cup inclination, reaming, and the uh, antiversion, you just use that uh, okay. in the mobile. And then you measure what is the angle of inclination you're positioning and what is the antiversion for that particular patient. So you will position your cup parallel to the inner margin of the tal, and then you can document what is there, what is it in that individual patient. Got it? Okay. Similarly, with the femoral version you do, and finally I will show you how to measure the combined version. So this is an important step. The, uh, this is the ceramic ball, and uh, this is the polyethylene you know, uh, socket for the younger audience. So this will articulate, in, uh, go and lock inside this one. So the first articulation happens between the ceramic and the polyethylene. And once that range of motion is over, now the polyethylene will move inside that polished metal socket to prevent it from dislocation. The trade-off for this, you will have a larger diameter head. And if you don't position your components properly with edge loading, this polyethylene will have greater wear. The volumetric wear can be more. And if the wear happens at the inner bearing, this will dislocate. It's called intraprosthetic dislocation. So these are the uh, flip sides of the dual mobility. It will help us avoid dislocation. At the same time, these are the trade-offs. So you must choose it carefully. So if the patient is a poliomyelitis patient or a, a very small size socket, dysplastic hips, where the instability risk is highly higher, those sort of patients you must use primarily the dual mobility. Elderly patients with fracture neck femur, Wherever we are doing revision surgery, wherever you find that the instability risk is above 5%, you must use something primarily to avoid the uh, uh, instability risk. Wash. Is that clear? Yeah, but then using this implant is not an insurance against dislocation. You still have to follow the meticulous steps absolutely, of the surgery. Absolutely. So the, the uh, use of special implants is not a warranty against poor surgery. So you should still get your combined inclination, combined version right. Uh, you must get your cup position, the stem position, leg length, offset, everything perfect. So for any ceramic bearing, you must have a dry taper and a non-angular assembly. So it must be linear assembly to prevent fractures. So we just make sure that that happens. And then once that is done, now we are able to reduce the hip into the stablum. That looks good. Okay. 
obviously. So now we'll just show you what is the. So I'm. Uh, can you zoom out here? Somebody zoom in here. You can hang on a cut. Yeah. So this is the position of the hip. So I will uh, flex the hip around 20 degrees and internally rotate the leg. Can somebody zoom out the leg? Idi zoom out chain. Yeah. Adi change it. Idi idi zoom out chain. Ah, zoom out chain. Out out. Yeah. So I'm internally rotating. You can see that. Yes. Can you see that? Yeah. Ikkada leg hand up bata. Idi idi baad kiche shin hoka kiche. So now the uh, everything is parallel to each other. Idi leg ka leg hand up chupal. Ab dakka. Sorry, ni gana bata. Ikkad ni chupi chana na. Yeah, you can see that now. Correct. Can you see that? Yeah. 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 So these are parallel to each other. The cup, the head, everything is parallel to each other. And this is the position of internal rotation. Can you give me the phone? So the combined version is around 26 degrees in this patient. So you can see that. Thirty-six degrees. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that is because there will be some error to the leg positioning. So you saw that it was around eighty-eight degrees when we measured the stem version as fifteen. So there will be one or two degrees error, but still you can go between the twenty and thirty-five mark which you want. So this is a male patient. So we are aiming for between twenty and thirty. If it's a female, we will aim for thirty-five degrees of combined version. Correct. Yeah. So now that's that's that. This is the stability testing. Flex the hip, adduct. That's the sleeping position. Internally rotate. You know, almost 50 degrees. Full extension, external rotation, abduction, adduction, full extension. So, and when I externally rotate the hip, there is no impingement between the trochanter and the ischium. Okay. So these are all the tests. We don't do any tests because we know that it's going to be fine. And uh, if you follow the principles, it will be okay in most of the cases. Thumbs up, sir. Do you do shock test for this? No, no, no. It is at all, not at all accurate. So this okay. is the piriformis, and you can see, and you can see the piriformis just falls back exactly where it should. Correct. And this is an indirect evidence that you know, so all the posterior capsule just falls back. And right. And we make drill holes into the bone and repair it, and uh, that's about it. Right. Any questions from the audience? Because we are running short of time, and we need to still complete two more talks. Dr. Krishna, thank you very much. Thank you. It thank was you an excellent me. demonstration. We love the way you showed and very good work from the cameraman. We were thank able to see much. the surgery very, very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Managing board. So the next talk is going to be on managing bone loss in revision knee replacement. by dr busi reddy narendra reddy so already we are late and uh, i don't think uh, Uh, our mood is uh, any any receptive at this point of time only tongue is thirsty so i'll try to so i'll try to finish off as um, fast as possible because most of the slides what i have is been already discussed by my precursor where uh, some bone augmentation and some points were discussed okay so um okay so all the revisions are not the same so what the bone losses there are no rules especially the the uh, the classifications the bone loss in the revision scenario is uh, is totally a difficult position because every case the bone loss is different so what are the why should we have the bone support or why should we you, what is the impact of this uh, bone defects when you are doing a revision surgery because the main thing is you need to place uh, the placement of the process is very important and the maintenance of your mechanical 
um, alignment and limb length alignment is very important in the implant long longevity. So, what are the causes for this, uh, this bone loss? When you see there is a mechanical wear, aseptic loosening. In the Indian scenario, the patient is not presenting to you even though they present with a, uh, a aseptic scenario or infection, still they take some more time to decide on the revision surgery. Revision surgery is a surgery where the patient feels that something has disastrously gone wrong with the primary surgery and is so tensed up to go for the second surgery, especially when you are doing with an infection scenario where you need to do a two-stage. That means the patient feels that he has to undergo for about four surgeries. What are the causes of the diverse etiology? If you see, it's a malalignment and periprosthetic fractures and the stress shielding. So this is a classification. It is a direct textbook classification, but practically what is more important is whether the defect is containable, it is a contained defect, whether the defect, the posterior condyles of the femur is intact or there is a totally loss of the metaphyseal bone and the ligament stability. So these are the three points which you need to see whenever you want to go for the revision scenario. In spite of all these classifications, so one thing before I order my implants, what all I need is uh, the important point in understanding the bone loss in the uh, revision scenario. So there are some techniques like uh, I always feel cement is a god. Cement fills all the gaps. But where we are using cement only as a particular uh, 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 modality uh, in a revision scenario. In the primary setup, I think uh, the cement can be used. But in a revision scenario, I don't think uh, uh, revision is the cement is the only helping uh, product what we have. Then we think about modular metal augments. And this is a cementation liquid. I went to the primary. Um, uh, this is a primary TKR which has been discussed by the doctor before me. So I am not going in detail about these cementing techniques and uh, uh, screws. So what I feel is these are only for a primary uh, revision, primary TKRs. But when it comes to revision TKR, unless you have got intramedullary fixation, unless you support the system with intramedullary devices, only these screws and cements are the very rarely used. There are now. After the invent of these arguments, after the availability of uh, intramedullary stems and uh, all these uh, sleeves and uh, all these uh, tantalanium cones, I don't think um, um, the bone grafting and uh, allogenic bone grafting or autologous bone grafting, I think uh, it is slowly disappearing art and uh, very rarely these bone graftings uh, are used for the surgeries. So what is the advantage of uh, uh, this block augmentation is you get a better strain distribution and less tensile deformation rate and less compression force. All these points look, uh, these are all uh, engineering points, but uh, as a doctor's point of view, whether you are able to get a better fixation, mediolaterally you got, uh, there is no instability mediolaterally, and are you able to maintain the joint line? Are you able to get the mechanical axis? These are the four points what we need to see, rather than this understanding these uh, shear deformations and all. This is a simple case, the patient presented with a, a fall and a little depression and a fracture and the patient complained of pain and uh, once we went for the revision and this is a simple scenario where you use a block on one side of the tibia. I didn't even disturb the uh, femoral side because it's well fixed and uh, to use all these augments you need to put a stem inside. So stem is a must on the tibial side to use any of the augmentations which has to be used. This looks a very simple case. If you can see the x-ray is simple, but the patient presented with the fracture of the uh, tibial spine, poly, poly cam mechanism where you have a tibial spine that has been fr fractured and the patient has presented with uh, instability and uh, this is what uh, after removing the tibia, it is well fixed, but uh, um, here there is no bone loss. We took all the, all the uh, care so that we do not lose any bone, but still we need to use so much of uh, augmentation and it is a fully constrained knee because the primary surgery when you take out the primary implants, it is going into hyperextension. There is no medial lateral stability is going to valgus. So at this scenario, whenever even though we are not lost much bone, we need to build that flexion and ex extension spaces. So we need to use so much uh, augmentation on the tibial side and to get a proper uh, fixation. So uh, not always the bone loss is the cause for using augmentation. Sometimes we need to balance the uh, flexion extension gaps. We need to do all these things. And this is a straightforward case where you can see uh, the tibia totally sink. 
bone loss is mostly because we create so much of bone loss. While taking out the implants, we create so much of bone loss. If we are really little bit patient and put some time into taking out the implant, we sometimes uh, save the bones. Most of the times we take out the posterior condyles, sometimes we take out the uh, distal condyles of the femur. So better is uh, we can save some bone by our patients itself. So this is the other uh, scenario where we used uh, uh, fixation. And this is a bone grafting, this is a primary uh, TKR because I never used bone grafting in this, uh, in this recent days. So I just taken one, this old case which has been only in the primary scenario. But now I very rarely are not even using a bone graft for even in the revision scenarios. So what is helping, what is the drastic change in the total knee replacement revision scenario is the advent of this uh, titanium sleeves and wedges. This has made the life easy for the revision surgeries because we are not worried about how to rebuild the bone loss. Now we are worried about how to, how this, uh, they are giving a fixation as well as augmentation. If you see there are two types of things, one will give only fix, only augmentation, the other one will give us fixation and augmentation. So this advent of this, if you see this uh, case, where uh, we have taken out the entire tibia, after removing of the tibia, the medial side, we have fixed with the, after tibial side fixation with the tibial sleeve, you can see, you can clearly see the entirely, the tibial sleeve is exposed on the medial side because there is no bone. But still, there is a very strong fixation and very stable fixation. So you need not uh, require to augment with any bone graft at this point of time. So this is the constraint, this is the fixations, this is the availability of the sleeves which made the revision surgeries very simple. But today in India, the revision, getting the revision Im instrumentation, revision implants and revision sizes, it's becoming so difficult from last one year or six months. You are doing a surgery with a substandard sizes. Even with the sleeves, you are a very, it's become very difficult to get the proper sizings. And this scenario may be lasting for one more six months or one year later, I think we'll get a better um, positive, our revision scenarios. You can see, uh, how these sleeves are helping. These sleeves gives, one they give fixation, other the porous uh, coated proximal lens will give you the fixation part, the bone growth also. So this is on the femoral side, uh, in a revision scenario we are using. What are the porous tantalinear metaphyseal cones? Um, I got a very less experience with the only metaphyseal cones, cones implanted using the press fit system, maximum contact of the host bone is required. They require some amount of host bone. The problem is when you don't have a host bone. So when you have a host bone, to give a structural stability and a stable flat form, you can still try with the metaphyseal cones. So this is one case where uh, uh, this is a, a periprosthetic fracture, which I have plated, failed, again plated, failed, and then we went for a custom made uh, uh, processes. So this is other scenario where you can, you need to, uh, this is one scenario where the mega process or custom made process are used for the bone losses which you cannot rebuild. The, the disadvantages of these sleeves, this is already a revision, revision scenario. This patient presented with infection after the revision. So taking out those sleeves, there is no instrumentation properly to take out those sleeves. Uh, I have fractured everything. You can see medial, lateral, everything I have fractured. Uh, because even though it is tightly fixing, you can't leave it like that in a uh, infection scenario. Because you remove tibia and it is well fixed, you can't leave that metal inside and go back and do a uh, one-sided, you take the implant and this, uh, you have to remove that implant out to properly cure the infection and this is what I was left with after removing the, see the femur has been uh, fractured Then there is no other option except that uh, uh, using these uh, materials and uh, constructing the, uh, the proximal femur or the tibia. So these revision scenarios, especially in uh, infection times when you are using all these materials, imagine you get infected now, the other option what we left is only amputation of the limb, otherwise we don't have any such gap filling mechanisms. So this is one more case what we have done, the patient, uh, so uh, this is a summary of what we have seen, but in management of bone, understanding the bone loss is a primary important and before the surgery you should have understanding if the ligaments are uh, still I have got some support from the ligaments or what is my posterior condyles, anterior posteriorly will my um, implant is stable 
or it requires so much of augmentation. These are the things what we, we should take care and um, uh, take a proper decision before doing a revision scenario because this is a second surgery or the third surgery what you are doing. So preparation is very much important rather than going in hasty decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Uh, any questions from the delegates for Dr. Reddy? Everybody is in the mood to go for the call. dinner. We can have a drink and then discuss in the evening night also. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, our mood is still that day. Yes, sir, please. Right. Uh, sir, when there is so much bone loss, how to make good the joint line? When you have removed so much from the femur or the tibia, the native joint line is not going to be there. Then sir, how un un understanding joint line is, uh, in a revision scenario, so much of imagination is required. So much of imagination, what is the remnant structure, what is left there, or preoperatively the fibular head is uh, yeah. what you can see. When so much of destruction is there, I think uh, it's very difficult to get the joint line. Is there anything to you want? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, when you have this extensive revision, all your landmarks are lost. So only one landmark that is left with us is the patella. Okay, so you keep the leg in extension with all your spacers. You aim at the lower pole of patella. That's where your joint line you are predicting or you are anticipating to come. So lower pole of patella is the only landmark left, unless unfortunately a patellectomy is also done for your patient then. Or some meniscal scar if it is present. Or some meniscal scar if it is present. But as Dr. Reddy rightly said, either the fibula head, just five or 10 millimeters above the fibula head, and lower pole of the patella. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we'll quickly move on to the next speaker. Uh, the, another important gadget or any tool that's available is the hinge knee. So indications of hinge knee, Dr. Satish Patel. Okay, I'll just make it very quickly. If it will be done in five minutes. It's been a very confusing afternoon with uh, unicondylars, then hips, and going back and forth. So, uh, indications for hinge knees. For an arthroplasty surgeon, in many scenarios, it's a godsend because it really saves your lives, and the patients can be up and about because of the availability of these as well. Indications, of course, in very elderly patients, I've done hinge knee as a primary knee. Uh, these are people post injuries, uh, non-unions of supracondylar fractures, and they've been just moving themselves on the floor for years. And putting in a hinge knee in that scenario makes them upright. So it is a compromise, but it is a good indication in some people. Collateral insufficiency anytime is a good indication. Very severe varus or valgus, more than 20 degrees is a good indication. Collateral ligament loss, gross flexion extension, gap imbalance in revision scenarios when uh, you, you're, uh, you don't have anything thicker available, then hinge knee is an option. Hyperlaxity, post-infection, once you've treated infection, you have loss of bone, then uh, hinge knee is an option as well. Aseptic loosening, long-lasting aseptic loosening, sometimes, uh, not we, but the patients leave the revision surgery for so long that once you take away all the soft tissue, you're left with no bone at all. Then instability and bone loss in various scenarios. Now, the hinge knees have been there for many years, starting from 1975 till date. The good uh, joints came in at around 2000 um, with the modular rotating hinge designs, and these are the ones which have been lasting much better compared to the pure door, door uh, hinge. Uh, scenarios. These were very old joints, but they failed. The older papers you read in the uh, uh, on the net and uh, in the in the books about f are very high failure rates is because of the pure hinge joints because they will loosen at the 
uh, implant bone interface. The rotating hinge, uh, many companies have come out with these. Luckily, some Indian companies are there as well in the scenario now. So much more affordable compared to the, uh, some of the MNC rotating hinge knees. So on the left, it's a processes uh, rotatory tibiofibular system, and on the right is a non-rotatory hinge tibial joint. Indications have been there for hinge joints, and 2018, there was a good paper by Cook et al., and they did a review of the literature on rotating hinge processes for complex revisions. And the findings suggested that rotating hinge joint implants demonstrated good survivorship, ranging from 51 to 92.5 percent at 10 years, so which is fantastic. Complication rates have been uh, quoted a huge uh, range from 9.2 to 63 percent with infection and aseptic loosening. And uh, rotating hinge knee processes were commonly indicated for infection, aseptic loosening, instability, and bone loss. So this is an endomodal implanted as a primary TK in a 74-year-old. Preoperative x-rays can be seen on the left, uh, immediate post-operative on the right. This is when a primary joint fails, uh, usually because of wear of the plastic, and you have uh, subluxation of, or dislocation. These are scenarios where we can certainly consider hinge joint. 66-year-old female with a hugely valgus knee uh, with all ligaments being loose. So in, even at 66, I chose to do a primary hinge joint in such a patient. She had an old injury in the, sub, uh, in the suprapatellar area. In the anteriorly, you can see there's a whole chunk of bone loss, a lot of osteoporosis as well. So in such a patient, uh, hinge joint, at least she's up and about, and she'll have a good quality of life. Post-op x-rays, yes. Post-infection knee joint with a spacer, when you take out everything, you find the gap is not reproducible with any of the implants. In such a scenario, a hinge joint is a lifesaver as well. This is a 61-year-old female with previous open injury to the knee, uh, Mercedes-Benz scar on the knee, uh, adherent scar. Uh, she, you can see she's been operated uh, previously on the right side. Someone has done a TKR. Definitely not uh, acceptable position. We went in on the left side and we put in a... We, this is the examination under anesthesia on the right. As you can see, she has a very adherent scar. Very scary scenario because these scars can break down and you won't get healing and she'll take months and months and many procedures to get it done. So we put a hinge joint in her. Uh, this is another 63-year-old lady with an MCL tear uh, while doing physiotherapy after an arthroscopy position. Her nephew was a, is an arth arthroscopist and he did a meniscectomy in her. She's 125 kg lady. And she was undergoing physiotherapy at home, and I think it was a root tear, so arthroscopy debridement of that wouldn't work anyways. So this lady hadn't walked for eight months, and uh, with a lot of instability she, uh, she had, and we did a, a hinge joint on her. As you can see, she cannot fit into a walker at all. She's just 15 days post-operatively, but she started walking for the first time eight months since the first scenario. So hinge joints are a lifesaver in many scenarios, and one has to keep an open mind f in using them. Till date, I've, I've not uh, found any of them loosening. Uh, I'm talking about a period of about 18 years. So for many of these patients, they are up and about because of the hinge joints. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dr. Patel. So, any questions for Dr. Patel from the delegates? To be honest, a pure hinges these days are used only as a as a compromise, and they are available with uh, distal femur replacement. So, uh, they were originally designed as a tumor processes, as a tumor processes, and if given a choice, we. At present, I use those processes only in patients uh, who are non-affording and they have a very bad supracondylar fracture post-TKR. I think 
another important thing with the hinge is that it has a, a much larger jump height. So you, you won't get a jump cam effect like a, a semi-constrained knee. Yeah. So yeah. that's a very important advantage of having a hinge knee, which has a, yeah, has a hinge rotating, rotating knee. Yeah. So we move on to the next session. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a last session, last talk, robotic total hip arthroplasty for fused hip in ankylosing spondylitis patient. Experience of Dr. Ashish Singh with the use of robotic arm, te arm technology. Ashish Singh is very happy. It's the last topic. Yes, I am happy <laughs> and everybody should be happy. So let's get moving with something new. So I'm going to talk about robotic joint replacement. From today evening, Krishna demonstrated a very nicely done hip, total hip replacement. But let's talk something new and something interesting. So what we aim in uh, arthroplasty surgery is accuracy, uh, confidence and reproducibility, and of course, a flexibility. The question is, in ankylosing spondylitis, we all are confused. Most of the time, people are asking, let us say, if you have a kyphotic spine, what will be your inclination, version? And there are so many questions which will definitely come. So we should also know wee bits of pieces, like our, uh, AS is also known as Betsu disease, and it is quite common in, to the extent of 24 to 36%. So why it is an enigma? The question is, what are the problems? Now, hip gets fused in different position. One hip may be in abduction, another hip may be in adduction or external rotation. It dramatically affects gait. It also affects the spine. And I believe me, I think not many of us like to get a spine x-ray before embarking on a total hip replacement. And sometime, developmental abnormal native establum version is there. And we do have limited literature support. So it is important because it increases the hips instability and it is one of the number one cause of dislocations, especially in patients with angst bond. Now the question is, what are we dealing with? So we deal with bilateral fused hip in varied positions. We deal with pelvic malrotations. We deal with hip abductors typically which are atrophic and we have to understand the position of neck gut and it is associated with high risk of dislocations. So these are some typical cases which we get and uh, spine is fused. It might be fused in both planes and abnormal rotations, pelvic malrotations. And these patients are young, so they have a high expectation. So what we need to understand is, very frankly, is the spino-pelvic relationship, which we don't give much care nowadays. Now, if you see your pelvis gets flexed as you sit down, and again, so this will show you in a much better way what happens. Hopefully this should work. So come back. So anyways, we go back to the last slide. See this diagram. The pelvis gets flexed when the, the hip gets flexed when you sit down. And there, therefore you don't have impingement and dislocation in general. But what happens when the pelvis or the spine is fixed and at the same time, when your pelvis is abnormally placed, like the angst spawn patient, they have hyperextended pelvis, or they are loaded sometimes like kyphotic spine, so it's all abnormal. So in this scenario, what happens? It is of paramount importance to assess your spine. So what I'm trying to say, that you need to assess your spine before embarking in a total hip replacement. And you have to categorize into three functions, three types. No spinal involvement, that means you have a patient, spine is absolutely fine. Spinal involvement without fusion and spinal involvement with fusion with in different positions. So step two is taking standing versus seated lateral. How do we take it? You have to be at the radiology room and on stools made up of wood, you have to make them sit and stand and then take standing and calculate the stiffness, pelvic slope and the anterior pelvic plane. 
this can be calculated in your packs and then you have to make sure that the pelvic slope does not move if it is not moving it is stiff spine if it is moving it is a normal spine and the normal value is more than 13 degrees if it is not moving in the range of 13 degrees it should move in the range of 13 degrees in general so now this this is possible only with the VROM which we have it in the MAKO system and we assess the virtual range of motion before doing a total hip replacement. So take it from here, we take an x-ray in sitting lateral, standing lateral, calculate the anterior pelvic plane, calculate the pelvic slope, then put it on the software. We have a 3D planning and we see the virtual ROM and then we can see in this diagram that yes, there is impingement, bony bony impingement and then we can increase or decrease the native antiversion of the establum. So what I'm going to say next, that there is no target. It's, it is not 4020. So let's go to the next thing. Dr. Krishna very well demonstrated putting a string and everything, but you have to analyze everything. Combined offset, combined antiversion, horizontal offset. It's not about one thing. He emphasized on the fact that you have to have multiple reference points when you're doing a total knee or a hip replacement. So let us see what, how do we get around these patients. So another thing is deformity in colonal plane. So let us say in the next, this slide, have a look at this patient. First, right hip is fused in abduction. So when you make this patient lateral on the table, either it will be free hip because of anesthesia or it will be stiff hip if it, if it is a bony ankylo stiff and then you'll have problems with the putting of your jigs. So this is an understanding which you should have. Second is that in conventional and robotic, there is a huge difference. In robotics, you have data, you have insight, you have the CT scan right in front of you. You can choose your version and take it from there. And of course, it is technically demanding. And usually these patients need bilateral hip replacements in a single sitting because if you do one, tend to leave the other, you might have dislocation. So we need, are we compromising with the patients? If you're doing without any technology or not seeing anything, actually, yes. Let us see how. So at Anup Institute, we are proud to have the latest robotic gadgets to help us. And uh, we do a CT scan. We do pre-op planning. And the scenario is different. We plan, we, we do the landmark placement, we put the pelvic array and take it from there. You have absolutely three-dimensional planning and you are there. So let's see, let's come to this case. Yes, with fibrous ankylosis, patient walks like this. You can see kyphotic spine and his spine was fused as you saw in the last x-ray. And he's a young lad. He needs a total hip replacement. He needs a bilateral hip replacement to have a good life. He could not have gone to the washroom without even using assistance. So we calculated as I discussed the APP, the pelvic slope and took it from there. We planned the femoral broaching. What should be the antiversion? femoral antiversion, then we plan the native vestibular antiversion. This is how we plan in three dimensional where it should be. And we take it from there. And you can see that it has come upside down, but you we can take it medial or lateral. And then we have the post-op x-rays, something like this. Now, it is also very important to have your post-op calculations. So we did the calculations on radiographs surgical results were calculated and CT scan was calculated. So we planned an antiversion and an inclination which was not actually 40 and what we planned we executed. Seeing the deformity, calculating the pelvic slope and the pelvic anterior pelvic plane. Also since we are getting the real-time feedback on a CT scan, we always hit on the target, we plan which we execute. Now this is another ball game. This is a patient which is having bony ankylosis, unilateral hip, absolutely rare, but bony ankylosis, you'll see the patient is young and he, he wanted a surgery, that's it. And you see the CT scans, you can see bony fusion. So all difficulties should be anticipated. For, for the newer newcomers, it is very important in these cases to assess the abductors by doing MRI scan and also EMG, NCV scans. So how do we do it? Now, 
getting the fused hip by senior surgeons, what we do, we take multiple X-rays, plan, and then the C-arm does not fit in. We're not able to see. But with the MAKO or with the robotic technique, we are doing N-block registration. That means we take the femur and the establum as one block and very nicely execute, then plan the things. And then we have a magic knife. So as you must be seeing on the live surgery that we put a thumb and then measure it. Here we plan a resection level. And then when the probe gets there, it shows that it is a line where we are having zero, zero, where we planned. So here we have a magic knife. And then we just cut the, mark the neck at that position after exposure. And with single rim, we knew that we have to go this much in, that much medial or lateral from the teardrop. And this is how we executed the case. So robotic arms come from the opposite side. And we planned. And on the right lower bottom, you can see the green is being it's be, the green will turn to white and you'll have the cup which is what you want what we planned so see this picture so we planned it we just did the with the knife we cut the neck and then we have the head we are registering it so this is end block registration we have to authorize this authorize for this and then the mueco arm comes and then directly takes it there we don't need c arm actually in these cases so nicely done establum and the patient was actually, then it was verified on table. It was 4120. We planned for 4020. We got 4020. And post op X ray, patient mobilized within four hours. That's the protocol what we do manage, manage pain and mobilize every patient within a couple of hours. And follow up six weeks. So, so far, so good. We have done 38 bilateral hips, felt completely bony ankylosed hip, all robotic THA. You see the same patient with bony ankylosed hip, and you can see that he's dancing and he can sit with his hip flexed in the, and he's sitting here with his right hip flexed, which is actually a good result. And I have one year follow up, he's doing fine. This young boy had also ankylosing spondylitis. So he's now mobilizing. See this patient, he was having abduction deformity and he was not even able to go into the CT scan, but now he's fine. So my take home message is plan and execute. Failure to plan is planning to fail. Get spine x-rays before embarking on a total hip replacement. Understand spino-pelvic relationship, pelvic kinematics. Abductor muscles should be analyzed, MRI, EMG, and proper follow-up is always a good advice. And together, everybody achieves more. That is a team effort for all the young arthroplasty surgeons. And why we are still using traditional conventional techniques despite lots of evidences which we are coming. If you are a patient, would you like to have a 60, 70, 80% accuracy or about 99 to 100% accuracy? So we have enhanced 3D dimension. Both Merrill and other companies have come up with good robotic platforms. The entire things have changed. We don't think for three degrees external rotation and knee and it's all different perspective now, functional alignment is the role. And see the confidence in the patient. This is, I think, post-op day five, bilateral ankylosed with kyphotic spine. He comes and he stands and he's doing actually very good. His life has changed. So for more information, how do we deal with all these? You can get to this article, which is published online in the Secord Journal. And loads of other information are given. How do we go about in these cases? Thank you. Have a nice day. We'll all have a nice evening as well. Thank you. Thank you sir. Any questions? Probably the last slide, but last talk, so we all should be happy. We are done for the day. Any questions, sir? Do you uh, keep backup of any other uh, revision implants for such ankylosed hips? We talked about technology you have, but you got away with all primary uh, implants? I've got, see, for knees, it's a trend, uni, CR, CS. One question which everybody is asking, you are a CR surgeon or PS surgeon, you should try to conserve the bone. CR, then CS, then PS, then TS, then inch. Planning software, and then you are there. 